recording started. Um, so thank you all once again for joining us today um, at our Train the Trainer workshop. Um, the main aim is to ensure that different trainers are better prepared to teach on uh, researchers how to share their fair data. And we're going to share with you a couple of practical tips and tools um, that you can use in your training sessions. Um, a couple of information about the workshop itself, the presentations are recorded and will be shared with all the registrants of the event. Uh, please do ensure that you are muted during the presentation so that we don't record um, anything that you might not want recorded. Any questions can be um, added in chat or via Padlet and we're going to provide you with the link. The Padlet is anonymous, so any questions could be put there. Um, and all slides and materials will also be made available after the event on Zenodo for future use under a CC BY license, and we welcome everyone to use our materials during their training. Today's speakers and facilitators, we have um, a variety of people coming from a variety of archives from, uh, from CESDA. So I'm Christina Magder, I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service. Um, and I have today with me um, my colleagues Maureen and Vlad. Maureen is going to be a facilitator during the breakout room and Vlad is going to help ensure that everyone gets admitted into the room um, and the recording works okay. We also have our colleague from the Czech Social um, science are high. Johanna, uh, she leads on methodological research and data management. Dimitri from the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, a senior research associate that leads on data acquisition and data management. We have Mariana from the Croatian Social Science Data Archive. She's the acting head of the archive. Otto, um, uh, a colleague of Dimitri from the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, and he's a senior research associate. We have Oliver from Gisis Leibniz Institute for the social sciences, and he's the deputy head of data acquisitions in active. We can see we have a variety of people joining us today, and we hope um, that um, all the information that we provide with you is going to be useful. In case you haven't heard of CESDA before, CESDA stands for the Consortium of European um, Social Science uh, Data Archives. It consists of 22 members and one observer, and also we have 12 partners across Europe, as we can see in the picture. Now, the main mission of CESDA is to provide this distributed and sustainable research infrastructure. And to do that, we must enable the research community to conduct high quality research in social sciences and also contribute to the production of effective solutions to the major challenges facing today. Of course, in order to do that, we must train and teach. Without training and teaching, we won't be able to do either of these things. CESDA offers a variety of services supporting uh, tools that you can use. Um, so we have the CESDA training, we wouldn't be here today without CESDA, but we also have different digital tools that you can use, such as the CESDA data catalog, the European language social sciences thesauri, um, the European question bank, a metadata validator as well. And we welcome everyone that has not visited CESDA yet to go onto the website and see the different tools um, that can be used for your um, own um, research and training as well. Now, the CESDA Data Catalog, if you've never seen the CESDA Data Catalog, um, it's a fantastic resource in regards to data discoverability. The Data Catalog brings together all the data, metadata for the data hosted by um, all the archive members of um, CESDA. So um, up to date, I think there are over 30,000 um, studies made available in the Data Catalog. Um, and it ensures that archives are getting much more um, use um, across the European level. Um, it promotes discoverability of the data. And of course, it uses um, key standards uh, when it comes to um, fair data. Training wise, so today we have a train the trainer event is more focused on um, people that work in repositories, data stewards. Of course, all the materials welcome to be used by researchers as well. Uh, and we hope they will come handy to you. As we've seen, we have a couple of um, researchers joining us today as well. 
but they have a variety of events ranging from an introduction to the data management expert guide um, to the data archiving guide, um, events about um, archiving in general, data management, um, and so on. So please do check the CESDA training page for further information about training. Now, having said CESDA data management expert guide for anyone um, that works with data management. If you haven't had the chance to look at the expert guide, please do. It covers the key topics when it comes to managing research data for planning, organizing and documenting, processing, storing, protecting data, publishing, and also making data discoverable. It's available as open access on Zenodo and everyone can make use of the different um, chapters, exercises and information available there. Today's program, um, we've tried to put um, quite a few breaks in to make sure that people feel comfortable. So we have the welcome followed by Joanna's presentation on open science and data management planning basics. And it's going to cover key concepts, tools and resources that you can use in your training, followed by a short 10 minute break, getting a coffee or a tea. Um, and then we have a longer session on consent and ethical protocols in open science landscape and beyond. And here, um, Dimitri will do a couple of presentations, a demo, but also a short table to see how different archives react to ethical considerations followed by a, a long one hour lunch break. Uh, we hope that gives you enough time to, to rest after two hours and a half. Um, and once we come back, we're going to discuss a little bit data protection considerations and anonymization in the GDPR context. We know with um, open science training, it's very important to include information about anonymization, but also legislation. And we're going to see um, how license frameworks and differences the archives operate. And we have four um, archives presenting today. And once again, thank you to all of our presenters for joining us. Um, and right at the end, we have a breakout room session. Um, is by no means compulsory, but we do hope people will stay with us and share their successes, challenges, and also potential they might have discovered today, either for open science training, consent and ethical training, or license and anonymization training. And right at the very end, we have a closing presentation, just covering, um, doing a recap of today, uh, what we've learned, where the materials will be, and how we'll keep in touch. So the main objectives of the workshops are we're trying to raise awareness of the key tools and resources available for open science training, but also enable a platform to exchange ideas because we all have different experiences when it comes to training and we do learn from each other. And finally, of course, provide the training materials in worksheet for your own future use. Again, all the materials for today, and we're going to shortly put the link in the chat, are available on Google Drive, but they will shortly be made available via Zenodo to use um, at your own convenience with a DOI so it can be cited um, and used in your training. And that is me. For the minute, I'm going to um, pass the presentation to my colleague, Joanna, about open science and data management planning, key concepts, tools, and resources. And I'll stop my share. Joanna, the, the room is yours. Okay, thank you very much. So now I will try to share my presentation. Uh, hopefully I will be successful. So let's go to it. And... Uh, uh, a second. So right now you should see my presentation in full screen. Great. So we started the success. I'm very happy. And let's go for it. Uh, as Christina, she's already presented me, so I will not uh, bother you with the details about my person. I just uh, I just mentioned that I'm from the Czech Social Science Data Archive. And uh, my presentation here today is about the absolute, absolute basics of open science and data management, which means that we will talk about the very most key concept of uh, open science. And we will uh, talk about the data management planning and the data management plan in particular. So as we have all be, uh, been aware of, this workshop is, is uh, the train the trainer. 
workshop. So I will try to keep the perspective, uh, bearing in mind that uh, this is actually something uh, we should talk from the perspective of uh, of the trainer who wants to teach or instruct the researchers. So hopefully I will keep uh, keep up with that, and I, I will I will pass on you uh, some ideas how to uh teach the basics of open science and data management but first of all we have to uh define the the, the basic concept so uh let's go to uh the open science in the first half of my presentation i will try to explain what is open science and why it is important and why it is important for the researchers in particular and in the second half, I will talk about the data management plan. And I will try to stress that uh, DMP, data management plan, is something that it's very practical and researchers should use it and should know how to do it. So uh, let's go to the open science. If we look at the formal uh, definitions, open science is something like removing the barriers to share science. If we look at the official, uh, the official definition of OECD, it says that uh, open science is uh, an effort to make the primary outputs of publicly funded research results, which means publication and the uh, and uh, research data, uh, publicly accessible in digital format with no or minimal restrictions. The digital format is very important because uh, the digital technology is the prerequisite of open science. Without the digital technologies, there would be no open science. Uh, as you already know, open science involves mainly open access to publications and research data, but it also means that the, the software that is being used should be open source that the collaboration between researchers, institutions should also be open and uh, uh, like clear, clearly, let's say, uh, transparent, uh, and that there should be uh, other sources of information available, like open notebooks, open educational resources, and uh, so on. Uh, Actually, uh, the open science is something that's been debated uh, for, uh, let's say, several years. Let's, let's not be uh, concrete. But the situation is that uh, we are not in the stage of open science uh, systematically. There are efforts to make the science open, but uh, the ultimate goal of the of the uh, of the endeavor for open science has not yet been achieved. So the current goal is to move from the situation of uh, uh, of the closed science, let's say, towards the system where the science is open uh, to everybody who is interested in it. And the ultimate goal is then the change of system. Uh, in which science is open as possible. Uh, there might be uh, questions. Why do we want to have science uh, to be open? Uh, there are several main reasons, uh, and these reasons are reasonable. Uh, the first uh, says that uh, open science help create high standards for scientific work. And it's, uh, it's a result of uh, fast exchange of know-how and information. And uh, for this reason, for this uh, high uh, speed exchange of know-how and information, the open science can uh, serve as the driver for innovation, uh, which is something that uh, the scientists and the society want. And there is also one reason which is or more pragmatic and this uh, reason is that open science saves resources it saves time and money as uh, researchers 
and institutions are, and everyone in, involved uh, use the, the outputs of scientific research that's been produced by somebody else. So there, there is a continuity and there is no need to produce something that's already been produced by somebody else. Uh, we can, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we can also ask, uh, let's say, uh, more. Wh wh why is it necessary? Like, wh why do we need, uh, uh, yeah, why do we want open science? But how can we look at the open open science? Well, like, what are the, the, the perspectives of uh, actually wanting uh, to have the science to be open? And uh, the first uh, perspective uh, says that uh, scientific knowledge is a product of social collaboration and its ownership belongs to the community. This perspective is sociological. It stresses the importance of, uh, let's say, uh, all these ties existing in the society and that as the scientific knowledge is a product of social collaboration, so that should be uh, available to everybody. Very similar uh, perspectives is the public perspective. Uh, and it says that scientists must be made public because the public has right to have access to it. Uh, it's also cl uh, closely tied to the de democratic perspective, which stems from the classic democratic uh, concept uh, that uh, public goods should be equally distributed or uh, and this is uh, derived to the uh, results of or outputs of scientific uh, research and knowledge. So the democratic perspective says that the access to knowledge must be equally distributed, that everybody in the society has equal right to access. The, the scientific knowledge. These uh, perspectives are sort of philosophical or social scientific or political, but the other perspectives are more, let's say, uh, pragmatic. They are, they are more uh, focused on the actual uh, utilization. The economic perspective says that scientific outputs were generated from, uh, uh, from uh, from the from the money, the public money, uh, so that uh, they should be uh, these scientific outputs should be able to everybody at no cost. Uh, this is strongly tied to the pragmatic perspective uh, that say that the production of knowledge will be more efficient if scientists work together. And there is also the infrastructural perspective that says that efficient research needs available uh, tools, data, and applications. So these, these three perspectives are more, uh, more uh, focused on the actual output, on being uh, effective, on uh, saving money, and uh, yeah, being effective. So uh, now we know why uh, we want open science and what are the uh justification of of the open science and i think that when teaching about uh, about open science it is important uh, to show uh, the audience that there is a basis philosophical economical political for uh the science to be open and let's move to uh to another uh, slide uh when we talk about the open science, uh, we know that there are several actors involved in it. And these actors could be divided into two groups. The first groups are institutions and the second groups are individuals. The institutions are much more powerful than the individuals. They are universities, college, journals, project funders, etc. just the large, uh, larger or smaller institutions that uh, provide money and that have power 
to decide what is going to be, or what is going to happen, who will get the money, who will uh, study this issue and that issue. So these, these institutional actors are actually uh, powerful and they have the power to uh, sort of uh, promote the open science. And they also have the power not to promote the open science, but it's another, it's another discussion. But we are here today for training, to, to learn how to train the trainers. And uh, uh, the trainers are then people who give instruction to researchers, to the individuals. So when we uh, teach, or when we do training about uh, open science and data management, we talk to the individuals and we mostly talk to researchers or data archivists or data managers. And so it is important to stress the importance of individuals, of, of people who are not, who are just, they are just individuals, they are not institutions, they are not that powerful, but uh, talking about researchers, they also have some power to contribute into open science. And it is uh, true that if researchers will not uh, contribute to open science by their actions, by how they work with the data, how they work with the scientific results, there will be no uh, open science. So it is important to uh, focus on researchers and explain to them that they can contribute. And mostly how researchers can contribute to open science, it is by following the very well known mantra of fair data. Everybody or every one of you uh, heard about fair data many times. It really is a mantra, I'm not ashamed to say. So we've all heard it many times, but it's important to pass this mantra to researchers. And we have to explain to them that findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable are not just fancy words. It's not just a, a claim or advertising claim. It's something where there really actually is something behind. And we can show to researchers that in each point in FAIR, they can make uh, the science open by themselves. If we look at uh, working with data and metadata, this is what researchers do. This is what also data archivists do. So if we have data and met metadata, we want to make them uh, fair. We have to uh, explain to the researchers what it actually means. So if I want the data and metadata to be findable, uh, we have to explain that there must be persistent identifiers assigned to data. There must be very rich metadata for so that everybody understands the data. And the rich metadata also have to be published. Uh, the accessibility with respect to data and metadata, it means that the persistent identifier the data are assigned with, they have to be findable. We have to retrieve them. If, or other people have to must have the opportunity to re retrieve them, uh, and that the metadata must be available. Let's say forever. It's just I know it's exaggeration, but the important thing is that the metadata should be available to the community or the public even after the data itself are not available. The third point in fair interoperability. It means that the researchers should use formal and broadly applicable language. They should use vocabularies, for example, the ELST, uh, the, the test hours we are uh, working on in SESTA, and the data should, should have the references to other data. And finally, reusing the data. Again, all the data must have rich metadata, they must be a license so that people know what they can do with the data. And of course, the data must meet, and data and metadata must meet domain, domain standards. So this is how researchers can make their data and metadata fair and thus contribute to open science. Uh, quite the same can be said um, with, if we talk about the research, research cycle. I guess you all of you knows what the what the research cycle is, and in each 
phase of the research cycle, there are opportunities for making the data fair, just as in the at the beginning in the data collections, uh, there must be uh, usage right very clearly stated, and the data and instruments that were involved in the data collection must be cited. In the processing of the data, we already mentioned that. Uh, the open source software is preferable so that other people can work with the data in the, oh, I don't know, some statistical package, whatever. Uh, the important part of the research cycle is storing the data. So it's it's a very important part of making data fair to store the, uh, the, store the data, to, to put them to the data repository and let the guys in the archive to handle the data properly. Uh, and of course, reuse, like really uh, having uh, having some sort of a, uh, like really want to that the data are reused and and do something for that. Uh, there is a thing that uh, if you if it happens to you that you will talk with the researchers about open science, about making data fair, about storing data in repositories, it can happen to you that the researchers will raise a complaint, let's say, and they can say that they don't want to uh, share their data with the uh, with the research community. It can happen. Uh, because uh, we all know that the that science is a competitive environment, and uh, researchers are encouraged to build their careers, to build their prestige, to stand out, to be cited, and to have like the best publications and so on. So these uh, researchers are sometimes protecting their sources. So that sometimes they have data and they feel that these data are really good and they can like do much with it. Uh, so they don't want to share the data. So we have the clash between two perspectives. At one side, there is the perspective of open science when we want the science to be open as much as possible. And on the other side, we have the competitive environment of science where researchers want to protect their data. Actually, they want to keep them from themselves. Themselves. I have a very recent experience. Uh, we were at the meeting with researchers. We were explaining to them uh, that the project in wants or involves the data sharing during the, the data project. And one of these researchers was very unhappy with that and explained that he does not want to share the data even after the project. He needed for several years to, to make use of it. So I, I think that the only thing that we can do at this moment is to uh, just uh, put, explain to the, to, the, to the researchers that uh, there could be put embargo on data sharing for several years, and it can be like negotiated how many years the, the researchers will have time to fully, uh, fully work uh, with, with, with the data. Okay, so uh, it was, uh, oh, my, my screen stuck a little, okay, we are back. Uh, just a short, uh, uh, mention of the SSH training discovery toolkit. It's very, uh, it's very handy uh, for the trainers uh, because you can find here lots of information and lots of platforms, a uh, lots of resources uh, for for instruction, for training, for education. Uh, you can find here courses, videos, workshops, things like that about uh, research data management. Uh, and, and many other things, even open science, but uh, other things which are just about survey data and, and so on. It's mainly for researchers, data archivists, and it's 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 handy. So you can have a, a look there and and uh, find uh, 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 find something that you can use in, in the training. So uh, I actually got lost in time, so I don't know if, if I'm not uh, too fast or too slow, but uh, never mind. Uh, we still have the second part of the, my presentation, which is about DMP, or so to say, a data management plan. 
uh, if you look for the definition of what is this, what is DMP, you find that it's a formal document that provides a framework for how to handle the data, and the data material during and after the research project. This uh, definition is quite dry, but we have to acknowledge that DMP really is formal document, but the very important thing is that at the same time, a DMP is not only a formal document. Uh, when we talk with the researchers about the DMP, uh, they sometimes feel or they have the feeling that DMP is some formal thing, something that the founder wants, that it's just a formality, just to give it to the founder and, and we are done, that it's just some something some uh, a formal template some some form that you just give them and, and they are happy and uh, i'm out of this but it's it's not the case with the dmp uh, researchers must understand that dmp is actually something that is very practical for themselves and that without the dmp it's very risky to enter the the scientific project social scientific project, whatever, uh, because uh, they, as I will, I will talk about it later, but researchers really must understand that the MP is extremely practical tool. And this is the job of the trainers to explain to them that uh, researchers really need the MP, that it really is not just a formal document. Uh, what is, what is very important to say to the researchers is that the MP substantially improves the workload, workflow of their work, and it will uh, enable them not to get lost in their own uh, project. Uh, researchers should know that, as I said many times, the MP is very practical. It has considerable benefits. It's not difficult to make. Uh, sometimes researchers, when they see a template for the DMP, they are shocked and they are scared that they have to fill in some form they do not understand, and that they really feel like not, not very comfortable with that. Uh, our job is to explain to them that actually it's, it's pretty easy, it's not a rocket science, let's say, and that to make the DMP, it's not uh, hard work. Actually, it can be hard work when your project is quite broad, but it's if you do if you have a broad project and you don't do the DMP, you will be in a lot of trouble. So ex uh, researchers must understand that the DMP is something that will allow them uh, the easy project management that will allow them to know what's going on, what is supposed to be done. And also, uh, we, as we already know, uh, DMP makes the data fairer because it uh, forces uh, researchers to handle all these things that relates to fair data. Uh, uh, if we talk with researchers about the DMP, we we tell them about uh, let let them to uh, imagine that they have a very big project that will run for uh, it will run over several years. That's very complex. There are several data collections. There are lots of data sets will emerge from the from the project. So uh, the researchers actually must think about how they're going to collect the data, what data they will be collecting, what sort of data will be produced. They have to know it at the beginning of the project, not that they are going to find out in the, in the middle of the project. They would get lost and they would be in a trouble. So uh, these things that DMP requires from uh, researchers, it's all the things that the researcher must know at the beginning of the project. They have to know uh, when the data will be collected and how they will be collected. They have to know how, will, how, how researchers will handle the protection of respondents, how, they, uh, how, res uh, how researchers are going to manage the data during the research project and after it. Uh, uh, it tells them who is responsible for what in the project. And also the very important thing every researcher must know at the beginning of the project is the budget. 
And if we have a proper data management plan, plan, we know how much money we will need for what. Uh, the important thing also is that there exists a lot of diversity in the MPs. There, there exists several templates, several forms. Each of them looks differently. There is no DMP, like one DMP that everyone has to uh, use. It's not like that. Uh, and it's because the, the different uh, scientific domains, if it's social science or if it's natural sciences, each, each of these dom domains are very different and they have different needs. So the, the data management is actually the data management plan is actually something that's related to the to the content of, of the of the research project. So there exists a variability in how the DMP looks. And this is something that uh, researchers should know. Because from my experience, uh, the researchers are sometimes uncertain about uh, preparing the DMP. They don't know what information should they put in it. And they are actually worried that they will put something wrong into the DMP. Because as we as we have the DMP, it's some sort of a template, it's some, some sort, sort of a form. And it reminds people of some like, uh, let's say administratory papers they fill in at the, the bureaus let's say and they're afraid that they will fill in something wrong so, so they feel anxious about it mm -hmm. and uh, our job is to explain to them that they should not be afraid of that it's a form that it's a template they should be creative they should put into the dmp everything they think is important as i say uh, it's not uh, when I speak about DMP with the researchers, I'm telling to them, this is not a tax payment, tax payment form. This is not something that goes to government and government will, will find out that you did something wrong. No, a DMP is something that's much more variable and it allows researchers to put in it everything they consider to be important. So the researchers should not be afraid uh, to be creative when they put the information into the DMP. And uh, they should also bear in mind that DMP is mainly for them. They, they can think about what is all the information that I can actually forget in several months and I will need it in the future. So as every researcher has some uh, experience with with the workflow with the with the project management they know themselves what is important to know about their own data or they can look somewhere else they can look into the dmp we have in sesta which i will show you uh just a few few moments later uh but as i'm now stressing that uh researchers can be creative and they can put into the dmp everything they need they should also take into consideration the requirements of the funder of their project because sometimes in uh some european countries uh the dmp is mandatory and the fund funder actually gives the the researchers the form how it's gonna look what what should be there so if there exists such a template uh, researchers should use it and they would see themselves what sort of information will be put into the dmb uh overall we people from sesta we recommend to make the DMP all the time, no matter what, just do it for yourself. If you are a researcher, you have a project, make your DMP because without it, soon or later, you will get lost. But uh, the, uh, the, real, the reality in, uh, in Europe is that most of the funders do not uh, require the DMP as a mandatory thing. Um, so uh, there are projects that require it, and you may know about the Horizon 2020 project that this funder really uh, wants the DMP from, from the researchers. Uh, but so if we look uh, to the European countries, we see that in many European, European countries, the DMP is not mandatory yet. 
but in some countries such as Finland, Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and UK, in many uh, funder, many funders require it. I recommend you to look into the DMAG Data Management Expert Guide we have on this website. It's linked here. You can have a look there and see which funders in which countries require the the D DMP. Uh, when I talk about the DMP, when I talk about it with the researchers who are mostly sociologists or political scientists, uh, I strictly tell them, use the DMP template we have in the DMAC, in the Data Management Expert Guide I have just mentioned. Go to the DMAC, look at the uh, DMP template that is there. Uh, it's, it's very well described. You have lots of information there, and the template, which is available in DMAC, is very uh, concise. It's 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 very practical, and you can you can see clearly uh, what should be there in the DMP, and it's suited for social sciences mostly. So uh, if you if the researchers you are involved with are social scientists, they will make use of this. Uh, the MP template and it will work for them uh, very well. Just uh, very quickly, what is there in the DMP? Uh, there is it, every DMP starts with the general overview. So, what is the title of the project? Who is the founder? Who is the uh, principal researcher? Who people? What people do what? The the assigned roles, and. Uh, Maybe there, there can be uh, uh, some information about the budget. The second part of the DMP is about organizing and documenting data, information about data collections, uh, data organization, documentation, metadata, the metadata starter, standard that it's going to use, just the, all, all this sort of information. Uh, there, is, uh, there should be information related to the processing of data, uh, and important information about storing the data, where the data will be stored, how they will be backed up, uh, what will be the security, how the security will be handled, how the data will be protected, uh, information about the ethics, informed consent, uh, protection of the respondent, all this information. Uh, follows the information about where the data will be archived, how they will be made available, and it also can contain, the DMP can contain, contain the information, the secondary analysis, the data that uh, were not collected in the research, in the research project itself, but the data that were taken from uh, archives and being reused. But I don't want to bore you with uh, what, what are the individual in, information you have to put into the DMP. I think that everybody can uh, find it themselves. If you look at the DMAC, which I really strongly recommend, uh, you can use the template there, you can print it out, show it to the researchers you work with and uh, talk about it with, uh, with the researchers. So here are just uh, some references to uh, somewhere you can go and uh, read uh, for yourself and just just useful information and this is uh, the end of my presentation i thank you very much for uh, for listening to me and i hope it was uh, at least for something that you uh, learned at least something so i stop sharing now uh, are there any questions Thank you so much, Joanna. That was a fantastic presentation. You got some fantastic feedback in the chat as well about the presentation. And there are a couple of questions. Um, I'll, I'll first pick up the one in the chat, whether we know if HAL, um, HAL Archives do they, um collaborate with DMPs, they host uh, DMPs. That, that's not something that I personally know, but maybe someone else today knows. And which uh, which question is that? Because I want uh, want to. It's in the chat. You say yes. Yes. Uh huh. And it's uh, about archives. You say. 
Because, uh, oh, one of our participants knows yes. that Hall does not require a data management plan for making a data deposit there, but they do require you to input metadata. And from the metadata um, record, it is much more effort to, to create the DMP. So this is why these events are great, because we get so many people with so different experiences that they might know the question. That, that's fantastic. But we also yeah. have, um, Joanna, a couple of questions. I can, uh, I can comment on this. Uh, just yes. uh, the archives usually do not want DMP. They really want uh, the metadata. Who, if there is an institution that wants DMP, it's always the funder. But the archives usually do not want DMP. They're okay with uh, rich metadata. Am I right? I think the main point is that the DMP is for project management. And when you go to the archives, they are already at the point where you have completed or in the process of setting it up. So archives typically helping if you've got a specific question regarding uh -huh. your project. Yeah regarding how to set up a DMP, but um, archives are typically in the situation where they expect you that you have an understanding and how to document and how to work with this and um, use then the metadata you derive from your project, you use the arguments that are key for everything to um, create an entry. And as many archives are broader, not only data archives, for example, HAL hosts not only data, but many other things as well, um, a DMP would not necessarily make sense um, for them to require. And therefore you have to be um, coming from the perspective of what does it help the individual researcher, the individual student to create a DMP. And this is it, simply the fact it makes your life a whole lot easier afterwards, just as mm -hmm. like uh, Johanna explained. Because if you're doing this, you can write publications much easier, you can satisfy your grant giver much easier, and you can archive your data much easier. So if you do it, and if you do it well, you can start it, uh, your process in the research field um, much more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yes, can, exactly. Can, cannot, cannot agree more, um, um, and I, I, I hope researchers today, but also data stewards, um, uh, have a lot of takeaways in regards to data management planning, because as Joanna mentioned, sometimes it's seen as this extra document, but it, it, it is so much easier for researchers to share their data if they have a good data management plan. Um, and we have an additional question on our um, Padlet. Can I ask this question? Oh, yes, yes of course. Okay, I just would like to ask, um, how does uh, DNP will make publication more uh, or easier? Uh, does it, um, I mean, um, it, it, it is in the process of writing a paper or uh, the process, uh, it, its intervention is in the process of letting a paper uh, uh, have a, a good, uh, let's say, uh, <clears throat> impact or does it or uh, does it have a uh, um, relationship with a private uh, journal how does it uh, help uh, publication um it helps you to organize all the things you need for publication it's a checklist that you should think about when you do your project what do i need to document and when you're doing a good dmp you will always collect necessary metadata, for example, for your method section in a paper, which could be very important. And when you're doing a DMP well, you're checking the boxes during your process of research, and then it's easy to collect it for a paper and to present it in an according way. It helps you during the writing process, so to speak, that you um, are not coming into a situation, oh, I didn't um, collect this or I didn't um, write it down in the necessary way or we didn't think about this during our data collection. It makes your writing easier because it helps you map out everything you need beforehand, before you collect your data and keep everything in mind that you may need later on for publishing or um, writing. So that's helping the research process. So it's kind of um a background you will need you won't use the dmp for example in a publication 
but it provides you with an outline what kind of data you have to trace, what kind of information you have to trace that you are able to do your research. Thank you, but um, thank you very much. That's just a, a last question. I am looking to the uh, site of DMP. There is no possibility to create a known count. Is it, uh, or I did it by, is there an, any possibility to have your own count, count in DMP or it is open just, uh, that's why I didn't say in possibility to create your own account in DMP. Uh, yes. Typical, sorry. No, I, I am so sorry. I think that's about DMP online. Uh, we do we do find those people to DMP online. So if you go on the on the main page, um, it, you should have the option to create an account. You have the sign in option and create an account, um, and you need to to select the um, organization you're from. But the public DMP is the funder requirement. You don't need an account for that. You can just you can just see them without having to be logged in. And yes, we, we have a, a, another question. The recordings will be uh, made available um, shortly after the event. We just have to um, curate them, uh, but they will be made available on the CESDA training YouTube channel, um, as well as the materials. They're currently on the Google Drive, but they will be put on as Zenodo with a DOI. Um, and Joanna, we have another question for your, for your fantastic presentation. In your opinion, do you think that if we could manage the DMP so well, then we could conduct the project successfully in the future and I'm going to well the the success of the project always depends on what, <coughs> what is the, uh, the substance of the project that the MP is just uh, a servant someone who can uh, something that can make your uh, work much easier because every one of us knows it we just you 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 don't remember things you make notes but chaotically you don't know where you put what and if you have a one document that forces you into thinking about everything in advance and the document into which you put new information so you have everything on one place so you don't waste time with these chaotical searching for information which actually it can also happen to you that you forget the information that was very, very important. And if you do your data management properly, you have all the information at one place, you will save lots of time and energy and you will be much less stressed. So uh, the uh, how, how good your research is, and how good your publications will be. It's on your, it's, it's your skills you have as a researcher, as a scientist. But if you want to make your workflow much easier, if you want to make your life easier, if you don't want to be stressed, have the DMP, have everything well, well planned and uh, you will be happier in your life, I think. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Joanna. That that was fantastic. I think we can go over how important the DMP is for the entire of the of the event, um, and it is very important. And we do hope that all the materials that uh, we're making available will come in handy um, to you. Uh, now we're going to break for a short um, ten minutes. There's break. one question in the oh, board. There's another question. I copy and paste it. It's about what happens uh, with countries with non-ethical governments. Publishing data can be used for negative means or goals from the government side. How oh, do you I deal thought, with this? I thought we can take that in the ethical session because I think yeah. with the panel, we're going to have so many opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll board this for the next session. We don't forget it. We um, keep it into account and we will discuss this in around one hour in a... I would say a session where we will have a round table on ethics and the ethics of data publishing. So we won't forget this command. 
no, we are not forgetting any questions. So please do, do put questions in the break as well. If you're making a QR code or something comes up um, and you would like to ask, please make sure to put the questions either in the chat or on the Padlet. Um, and we'll see you back shortly in 10 minutes. Um, thank you so much once again for joining us. Um, and Dimitri will take over um, at 10 past um, about consent and ethical protocols in an open science landscape. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, we hope you managed to get a cup of tea or coffee or just stretch, stretch your leg and legs a little bit. Um, we don't want anyone to be to be stiff after or during the event. Uh, I'm going to um, hand the presentation to my colleague, Dimitri, who's going to talk with you about consent and ethical protocols in an open science landscape. I will stop my share so that Dimitri can. Okay. Um, yeah. Um... Welcome everyone from my end as well. After the nice introduction by Christina before, um, I'm working for uh, AUSTA, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive, and I'm a research uh, <clears throat> associate at the University of Linz, working in the issues of empirical data. And so I know both the perspectives of someone who is embedded into an archive and should secure that data is stored, made available, and shared in a very broad way. And on the other side, I'm a researcher who sometimes has concerns or has some aspects of his data that he does not necessarily want others to uh, have access to. So I'm very often in a position where I'm of two minds. And then as part of my job I'm also teaching I have also to discuss this with students so I know that this is a very broad issue and today's session um, will try to address all those different aspects in the next um, one and a half hours we will firstly start with a short introduction from uh, myself regarding the ideas about sharing and making empirical research data available and archiving it. And then um, we will go into a presentation of certain tools and certain aspects that can be considered here and finish out our session with a roundtable discussion with people working and um, teaching at different European institutions that are archiving data and are uh, making data available, and we will get their perspective as well. So I'm looking forward to the next around 90 minutes. The first point I will um, discuss is why are questions about consent and ethics so important when we consider empirical research in the social sciences and uh, data archive? As was already put forward in the discussion before by Johanna, we have the situation that we are dealing with humans. We are dealing with 
humans who are giving us data when empirical research is done. As researchers, we collect data and we make sure that high quality data is available for research. We are formulating DMPs. We are designing our research in a way that it's, I would not say only good, but very good for um, analysis and understanding society. And then we want to make it available because of questions regarding the economic aspects, the political aspects, etc. And <clears throat> we are always balancing those aspects out with ethics. Is there a problem? Is there an issue that may come up when I archive data that includes, for example, political opinions, which includes information about certain private aspects of people that may or may not be problematic in a certain political climate? And how can we make sure that people who are giving us this data can't be identified or harmed in any way? And because of this, we are entering not only a legal debate about can data be shared or should data be shared, but also about normative aspects of our job. For example, what's the benefit and what's the risks associated with sharing data? And um, how can we align our normative judgments with um, requirements from funders, ideas that are tied to the idea of an open science landscape, etc. And at Auster, we are following, for example, a very, I would say, easy to understand, but maybe hard to use um, guide, guideline here. We are arguing that data should be as open as possible and as secure as necessary. And we try to balance out the different roles of stakeholders in the process. What should be available to whom? What is of public interest? What may be of relevance for other researchers to reuse the data? And um, what are the considerations that have to be taken into account from people who are filling out the surveys or giving interviews, providing the data in any way? And <clears throat> in this, concept or in this discussion, very often the idea of informed content, uh, consent pops up. The idea of informed consent is seen as central. And while there are arguments that there are certain legal aspects that have to be considered, while there are arguments that um, there are certain obligations to be fulfilled when we are asking someone to participate in a study, when we are asking someone um, to give us their information for um, research purposes in any way, we have to be very yeah, thoughtful and careful about how we word this. And when we are thinking about what we are telling researchers that are coming to us as archivists, when we are thinking about the role we have as educators, when we are dealing with students who want to do a survey for their uh, qualification thesis, when we are interacting on a level, we have to be very careful and very observative about this whole situation because there are not only all those aspects that are raised, but there are differences in local legislation. In this group that we are currently um, yeah, here in this room, in this very soon room, there are people who are coming from the European Union, people who are not coming from the European Union. There are some countries where there are specific rules in place concerning ethic boards, concerning the role that um, they play when approving studies and what they may or may not demand that has to be covered or should be um, yeah, not covered in a study. And in other countries, there are more or less individual judgments of scientists at play for this. And when we are working with this, we have to be very observative and um, balance the problems out. And the consent form and the informed consent helps us with this as it provides, a, I would say, roadmap to the issues. It provides not only 
and information, but it provides a roadmap, okay, what will we do as researchers with the data? Who is to be expected to see it? What will be done uh, with it in a broader sense, not only in the purpose of the specific research question at play, but who will handle it? Who will process it? Who will see the raw data? Who will see the anonymized data, et cetera? And um, we can use this as a foundation to guide us through the process and think about, okay, what do we actually expect to achieve with our research? Who may we help with it? Who may be able to reuse our data? And um, who can be, for example, um, included in a way that we have no problem with sharing it? Where should be boundaries? And I would say some sort of limitations at hand. And in this case, I think it's um, a good idea to take a look at the um, SESTA materials we have available because they are providing an outlook to all those problems when it comes to uh, social scientific data. There are two paragraphs that I think are really good that help us understand these questions and work with them. The first one is about the preservation of data. The one thing is, yes, we want to ensure within the specific framework that data is accessible on a permanent status, that everything is done in a way that data is as usable for as long, in an ideal case, permanently as possible. With this, we can ensure open science. We can ensure all the aspects that we heard in the first part of today's session. And on the other hand, we can think about, okay, what type of information that is stored in this data, this raw data, is actually necessary? What has to be anonymized? And what can be, uh, for example, trimmed or reworked to make it sure for participants to make it um, usable from an ethical perspective? What can we tell our participants or what can researchers tell their participants that will happen with the data? When you're putting those two things, preservation policies, and personal data, which may be sensitive, next to each other, you can typically find out um, what is a good way to go forward and what may be a good way to address in um, the frameworks that we are using and having. And as trainers, we should be aware of communicating this to the researchers. As researchers, we have to be aware of communicating this to the people who are participating in studies. And uh, overall, it's necessary that those who are working as data stewards, as archivists, as researchers, come together and discuss this and find out potential problems that may come up from an ethical perspective when we are sharing data and concern them um, in a way that at the end of the day, we've got both usable data and people um, that participate in studies stay protected. And when we are doing informed consent, people can decide this. We are um, quite expected to make all those steps transparent that are highlighted and make them sure to be addressed in a suitable way. And <clears throat> as I said, Typically, this is something that should be done in a discursive process where researchers, data stewards, the people um, that are involved in research should come together and think about this. In most cases before, when they plan the study, when they are doing their um, data management planning. But at the end of the day, when um, a data steward or an archivist gets the data, he or she has to make sure that the things that were discussed or not discussed are um, actually okay for him or her on an ethical perspective. And the consent form that is provided for a study may help with this, may help provide a basic information and make the judgment of the data steward, even if he or she is not involved in the study, clear on why to archive data or why not to archive data. And 
therefore it's very important to keep all of those things in mind and make a judgment as a data steward that includes all the perspectives, not only the ones from the organization, not only the ones that uh, represents the researchers, but also the perspective of those who may have given data and what they agreed to that can be done with their data. This is the main idea that um, should be taken into account or discussed here. And after this short presentation, we will go now towards a tool that helps cons yeah, um, design content uh, consent forms. And for this, we have invited the deputy head of the Austrian Center for Digital uh, Humanities, um, Walter Scholger, who is here with us right now and will give us a short introduction into the um, Daria Elder Consent Form Wizard, who is a tool that helps to create um, an, yeah, I would say basic form for informed consent. And afterwards, we will discuss it and move on to the round table. I'll stop my presentation and would like to ask Walter to take the floor. Yeah, hi everyone. I hope I'm understandable uh, from my audio Perfect. device. Just give me a short nod <laughs> if, if that's working. Very good. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks for giving me the chance to introduce the Elder Consent Form Wizard. You should see my presentation now, which of course will also be available um, after this uh, whole thing on Synodo. Um, <clears throat> so thanks to the organizers again. Uh, so to give you some very small context about this, this tool and why it came into being, uh, as it says here, I'm at the Center for Information Modeling, the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities in Graz, and I'm also involved in uh, Daria and Clarin, that's two European research infrastructure consortia uh, that deal with digital humanities. Um, and uh, so it's very you know, related to uh, SESTA. There's also a lot of um, cooperation going on between especially Daria and, and, uh, and SESTA uh, in many, many contexts, among them also uh, ethics and legal issues. I won't go into too much detail there, but you can you can look up who we are and what we are doing um, um, in the slide set, obviously. So where I'm coming from is ELDA, which is a working group within DARIA. Um, and ELDA stands for Ethics and Legality in Digital Arts and Humanities. Um, we are a very mm, community-driven group, uh, basically, pulled together from researchers of all over Europe. Uh, and we are working on issues that are of interest, especially to researchers, also to teachers, um, very much in the DH context. Um, and uh, it usually has to do with either intellectual property rights, data protection, privacy, but also research ethics and scholarly conduct. And we try to pick up on, on issues and, and questions of our community and then provide, for example, workshops, uh, do training materials, provide recommendations, or actually come up with tools that help our colleagues um, addressing these issues. Uh, and one of these tools obviously is uh, connected to the general data protection regulation. Um, you've all heard about that, the GDPR, it's been around for a while now, and it has seriously impacted and changed the way we do research as soon as we deal with living subjects and their data. Um, the GDPR is important in many senses, uh, even if you're outside of Europe, uh, because uh, it covers European subjects, data subjects. So even if you're processing data outside of Europe, but data about European data subjects, you're still subject to the GDPR. Um, also, it has created a, a large impact also on international projects uh, because it has become a legal standard that even people or countries or researchers outside the European Union are following these days because it's just a very, um, very strict accepted standard and has become a standard. Uh, so very briefly, the main parts or the main issues that are of concern to us regarding consent forms are two things that were introduced by the GDPR. 
One are the principles of data processing, and we can't go into too much detail here, obviously. Um, but that's basically the principles that have to be observed in order to process data under any circumstances, personal data, that is. It's always important to keep it in mind. We're not talking about measurement data and stuff like that, but we are talking about personal data, so data related to natural persons. Um, so these are the principles, uh, just skim through them very quickly, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, purpose limitation, um, data minimization, accuracy, and so on and so on. Uh, you can read up on all of that on the page that I gave you here, gdprinfo.eu. It actually covers the entire text and all the deliberations that went into it. Um, so it's a very, it's not partic a particularly pleasant read, but a very informative one. Um, the other thing, uh, what you, we have to keep in mind is that the basis of any processing of personal data has to be lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. And that's obviously what we're talking about also in terms of the consent form result, because consent, explicit consent by our data subjects is one of the possibilities to build this or uh, to build on this lawfulness principle. The other thing that is introduced and very strongly enforced are the rights of the data subject. Um, because um, the entire GDPR really is built on the premise that there are very strong rights attached to being a natural person. And these rights are the rights to information, to access, to rectification, to erasure, the right to be forgotten. I'm sure you've heard about that before. Um, restriction of processing, data portability, and objection. Again, we can't go into detail on all of these, but the most important one, and Dimitri has, of, uh, has already mentioned that before, is information. So giving information to our data subjects at the moment when we start collecting data. That's the important thing about this. Uh, and both of these things can be served with things like the consent from wizard. There's also another exception that we have to keep in mind, especially in research and archiving um, contexts. So that's something we, we really should, have, should remember. Uh, that's Article 89 uh, of the GDPR. For archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes or statistical pur purposes, member states may provide for derogations from the rights of the data subject if they are likely to render impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the specific purposes. Now that's obviously very legalized lingo. What that means in short and easy uh, is that for research and archiving purposes in the public interest, for example, free education, public education, and so on and so on, um, member states can actually waive these rights that we see here. Um, if the execution of these rights would impair the results of the data processing. So for example, if you do a publicly funded study about something and uh, you do a survey with people and these people could then withdraw their consent afterwards, um, obviously your study might be in danger of being devalidated or not, not being you know, uh, taken seriously anymore. Uh, and that means that for such purposes, very specific purposes, um, there can be um, exceptions to the rights of the data subject. Now, keep that in mind, <laughs> uh, but uh, be critical about it because this is a very general waiver um, and means that we can basically act against the interests of our data subjects. And even if that is in theory legally possible or also in practice legally possible, it's obviously ethically very bad practice. Um, so these are the exceptions summarized for you to read up on. I won't go into detail about that because uh, it's, I think, better if we actually look into the actual tool because that's something you can use. You don't need to log in or anything. You can just use it. So the consent form wizard is reachable under this website. It's multilingual um, at, up to this point. It's uh, English, German, Italian, and Croatian. 
Um, and there are a couple of other translations um, being finished at the moment, actually. So in the next couple of weeks or months, there should be at least two more languages, Slovenian and Spanish, uh, available, and probably also Ukrainian. We are working on that now. Um, so what is the Consent from Wizard? It's a project that was done within the, the shock context by, um, by Daria. Um, it was developed by a very uh, diverse group, which was important to us. So it was the Yetch researchers, it was ethnologists and archivists, it was a lawyer um, specializing in data protection, uh, developers and the research community at large. Multilinguality was a very strong issue for us because especially if we talk about consent and such contexts, uh, it's important to ask for consent in the language that your data subjects are speaking uh, because that builds trust and ensures that you are following the transparency um, principle. So that's a very important thing. Obviously with such, uh, such tools that are not officially funded, but basically done as on the side by researchers as their, as their individual projects. Uh, we can't cover all the languages yet, so you're cordially invited if you're interested uh, to do further translations uh, to get in touch with me and otherwise uh, just uh, use what's there uh, for now and have a look at the consent from wizard. We'll do that in a second. Uh, what does it do? Uh, it is a questionnaire-based tool, I'm going to show it to you in a, in a minute, um, which provides standardized consent forms in research context, that's very important. So we can't cover everything, but in a research context, we know what we're talking about. Uh, and they, these uh, consent forms conform to the GDPR. They satisfy both the lawfulness principle and the information right uh, of the data subject. So the two things that we were talking about previously. Uh, it is a legal tool, but it also establishes an ethical standard, uh, which is nice to know, uh, for example, that this is also used outside of the GDPR area. So we have colleagues in New Zealand, for example, and in South Africa who use our tool to create consent forms, even though they are not legally obliged to it, because this goes beyond the legal obligations, as we said before. Um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, which is a very legalized thing, but it's still something to keep in mind, is this general um, exception to the GDPR that I was mentioning earlier about public interest as the legal basis of data processing actually kind of um, competes with consent. So if you ask a lawyer, especially a research lawyer, they will always tell you that you should just build your, your, data, uh, your data processing on the public interest exception, not ask for consent anyway, uh, and just justify your data processing with uh, the public interest, especially in humanities and social sciences, that's basically a no-go. So for us, consent is, very important because it's all about either human subjects or the results of the work and, and thought process of human subjects. And so for us, uh, consent is really the way to go, even though it poses considerably larger legal problems than just building on public interest. Because if people withdraw their consent after you have explicitly asked for them, you can't just change around basically you can change the, the, the legal basis of your data processing to public interest afterwards so if you're building your data process on the consent of your data subjects you have to stick with that and that also means of course that you have to respect if they withdraw their consent even though that might torpedo what you're set up, setting up to do um so um these are just some screenshots, but obviously it's much better to look at the real deal, which means that I'm stopping my presentation very briefly and head over to my web browser because I'm a brave man and I hope that it will work as a live demo. Um, let's hope for the best. For now, it's uh, still available. <laughs> um, so welcome to the Daria Elder Consent Form, a wizard. Uh, and I'll be very brief because you can actually play around with it yourself, obviously. 
Um, so you can start down here uh, and enter. And these are the three scenarios that we are covering with the consent form wizard. Um, a, gather data from and or about living people for research purposes, which will probably be the most common purpose in your context of work. Uh, communication through mailing lists and digital communication media. That was a scenario that basically came out of the uh, of COVID uh, for, for very obvious reasons. Uh, and also gather data and consent from participants of uh, as the host of, a, of an academic event. Also something that was very strongly driven out of the out of the COVID experiences. Uh, but it's also something that happens very often in the research and culture context, obviously, that you're processing data just like, like your, your hosts or our hosts are currently doing uh, with this Zoom report. Um, so what we are going to look into very briefly, or just to, to give you a show of the look and feel of the whole tool, it's not particularly pretty, but it's very practical. <laughs> um, so first of all, you choose which kind of survey you're doing, how are you gathering recording and uh, data from or about your participants or data subjects in a study. Let's, for example, uh, say that we are doing uh, an oral interviews or just a sound recording. Uh, and it's, a, it's an input driven questionnaire. So basically with your input, the final form that is generated will grow. Uh, the form will only be as good as your input. So if you're lying to the form, you won't get a valid consent form out of it. So you have to be precise about what you're doing. Uh, you have several data uh, categories here that you can choose. Um, if you basically, if you don't, if you anonymize your survey at the very beginning and don't uh, collect any personal data, you don't need a consent form either uh, because then it's a totally anonymized survey. But that's very often not the case. So in most cases, uh, we are looking into specific data and especially even if we are if we are not asking per, two personal questions we usually want to know the names and uh, some kind of contact for example from our data subjects uh, there are sensitive data categories which are usually problematic um, and one feature of the consent form wizard that i can show you here is, which is very uh, very helpful i think is are you collecting information about third persons? So are you getting information about a third party from a person that you're interviewing? And if you're saying yes here, and these people are identifiable, so they talk about someone with a name or something like that, and you can also answer that as yes, and they're still alive, then you're done with your survey because uh, you need their consent and not the one, not, not the consent of the person you're talking to. So as soon as you have third parties in your work, uh, you are entering very, very sensitive um, context and sensitive territory. And that usually requires you to actually consult a specialist in that, in that uh, data, uh, data protection area. Now, for our uh, demo, let's let's think or let's say that we are not con collecting information about third persons. Um, and finally, there's also there's always uh, explanations and additional material linked within the consent form wizard because it's also a tool that wants to build um, knowledge on one hand and competence, but also to explain stuff. Um, so it's it's an educational tool and not just um, a pragmatical tool. Um, so this is where the input part starts and I'm going to be very quick. I'll just do test, test, test stuff. Um, so here you can put in the name of your research project, the domain of your project, a brief uh, description of your research interests, and for example, a website. Um, I'll just put in the Uni Graz website here. Um, and all of these informations will later fill out the template for your consent form. Are you collecting as uh, data as an individual or on behalf of a research institution? Usually in our research context, we will actually have the second part, um, uh, which opens the fields where you have to identify yourself and the institution. 
Um, and you also will be asked about the data protection officer um, of your institution. Most research institutions have one, um, but for simplicity's sake, let's now propose or suggest that we don't have a data protection officer. Um, next question is how long will data be stored? Here we can actually, for example, build on uh, the exceptions that we are provided by the GDPR for as long as necessary for the fulfillment of the defined research purposes. And the most important question is, will you share the data? Now, if you actually can answer this question with no, then you're already done. If you can answer this question with yes, and you're sharing this with another institution, with colleagues that are based at another place, you actually have to go through several more questions like, are you anonymizing data or pseudonymizing data before sharing it and so on and so on. For simplicity and time's sake, we will now answer, will you share the data? No, so you're just making a survey, you're keeping it at your institution, you're only sharing it with colleagues at your own institution. So it's always the same data processor. And if you continue here and finish, um, this is what you're getting. So you're getting a web preview of what your consent form will look like. And you can see all of these informations there that uh, basically Dimitri had on his last slide. Uh, who are you? How can you contact us? For what purpose do we process your data? What information do we collect? Uh, and so on and so on. Uh, for how long will we keep it? What are the rights of your data subjects? And so on. Now, all of these inputs, that's just a preview, as I said, on the web. You can download this whole thing as a text file and then adjust it to your needs, either as an online form, as a printed form that you can fill out. Uh, you can provide additional information. So this gives you a template of what has to be in there. And sometimes, depending on the way you're, you filled out the survey, there might be some language difficulties that you still have to address. Um, but it gives you a very, you know, a very solid base uh, to continue from, and that's kind of the purpose of the whole thing. Uh, it, it gives you the opportunity to kind of refine your, your entries and then come up with a legally valid, in terms of the GDPR, so of the European legislation, a legally valid consent form that might in many cases also go beyond obligations and serve as an ethics tool just as much as a legal tool. Um, so I think I did actually take a little bit longer than I uh, expected. I'm very sorry about that, but I always get carried away when I talk about these things. Uh, so now uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for this presentation and you were quite on time. So no worries here. Um, we've got some comments and some questions, especially about the GDPR related parts already um, coming up. Um, I think the one point um, that may be of interest is uh, Ryan asks who can decide which rights can be waived under which circumstances rights can be waived by um, certain situations. How can this happen that participants may waive rights? Um, well, uh, the, the only one who can waive, waive rights is the rights holder. So in this case, the data subject who provides their personal data. Um, <coughs> and uh, they can explicitly waive the rights. You can also, you can ask them, of course, to waive their rights. Um, but uh, any, any waiving of rights in, in practice has to come from the rights holders of the data subject. However, and that leads us to Article 89, and Oliver has, has also uh, written on that already. Um, in the GDPR, uh, there is the option for the member states to uh, build, let's say, uh, it's, it's an ugly word, but say, let's say loopholes, um, uh, into the national data legislations based on the Article 89 uh, in the GDPR. Uh, that um, how can you, how how can you call that uh, that um, allows you as a data processor to ignore certain rights or that takes certain rights away from the data subject 
if on one hand specific safeguards are kept like pseudonymization and so on and so on. And on the other hand, if uh, they serve this very, very specific purposes in the public interest, data processing in the public interest. Um, but uh, in actual legislation, this is usually very, very narrowly defined and very narrowly inter interpreted. So um, the, they, the, the usually legislation in the actual member states and also uh, with, the, with the European Supreme Court is uh, very strict about, um, about the personal rights, the rights of the data subject, and not so much about the exceptions. Okay. And Oliver, yeah, you're yeah, totally correct, of course. Uh, we are not building directly on Article 89, but Article 89 allows member states, or well, not really allows, but recommends member states um, <clears throat> to build in exceptions for uh, a set um, uh, data processing in public interest for archiving purposes, research purposes, and so on and so on. Um, and uh, for example, in Austria, that's in, in the Data Protection Act under uh, paragraph six. Uh, I have no idea where, where it is in German, but it is there in Germany, but it's there as well. Uh, so most of the member states have already introduced such clauses, um, but they are always very, very narrowly defined um, and stick to these, um, to these um, formulations of Article 89. Okay, perfect. Are there any other comments or remarks from the audience? Because I think this demo was quite interesting and the presentation helped contextualize it quite well. And it showed that there is um, a certain, yeah, I would say connection between legal and ethical aspects and that both can and should be considered when um, you try to gain informed consent from your users or your study participants. Okay. Also, just if you're using the, the tool and uh, you're, you're, of course, cordially invited to do so, um, the English version, version is the most, well, the most presentable. Uh, so with the German version, for example, there are some issues, obviously, which are grammar related because the consent form is always done from your entries. And since German grammar and also Croatian grammar uh, <laughs> is a lot more uh, taxing than the English one, you might have to uh, do more editing on the final, on the final uh, consent form template that you get. The important thing is download the template because uh, we practice what we preach, so we are not keeping that uh, up. So as as soon as you uh, as you leave, uh, your form is gone <laughs> because we are not collecting personal data other than in the process of actually filling out the the questionnaire. So again, it, it's always important that you actually download the raw text because otherwise it's, you, you have to go through the whole process again. Perfect. Um, if there are no questions that are directly addressing the presentation um, from Walter, we would switch to the round table format now where I would like to ask um, Marijana, Oliver, um, Otto and Christina to join me for a discussion on the relation between ethics and data archiving. And Walter will stay here as well. So maybe you switch on the cameras and we start with the round table. It will be organized in three rounds uh, where we will get some questions, where we will get some um, input on those questions and discuss the problems and challenges that are expected to pop up in this domain and then take audience questions into account as well. So either add to the board like you did already or ask directly at the appropriate point. The first question would go um, to <clears throat> Oliver coming from Gases, and it would be the first part, um, how do you think ethics and data archiving are related at the moment? What are considerations 
we should take into account um, when it comes to this aspect. Okay, I hope you can hear me okay. Perfectly fine. Great, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important issue. It's somehow related to what Johanna presented on the data management plan. So when you start your research projects, uh, I would say there are like three areas. You mostly engage into your research design. You've got a research question you want to answer. Uh, now your, your funders oblige you to come up with a data management plan. And um, at least in Germany, it's, we are like a latecomer here. There are general ethics boards. We do have a gen ethics committee at Gezes. And now you have to justify your research design. And um, I think it's a great way uh, in advance to, to look at your research design and probably face the challenges. And don't wait until the last moment uh, until you try to resolve them. Um, sometimes you might have to change your research design, but uh, it's uh, some 10 years ago, we started to do research man data management training in order to get to the, the beginning of the research cycle, uh, the, the research processes, because we were facing in a number of times uh, projects that were at the brink of, of ending, uh, staff was gone, work knowledge was gone. There was this data, you had a consent, we sometimes came across consent that said, the data will only be used within the framework of your project which means that the data needs to be deleted at the end of the project. Uh, uh, you have to understand it this way. And uh, so if you like sit down and you consider all the things that, that go, I mean, there are like checklists for ethics. Uh, this is a great way, although it's time consuming sometimes uh, to really look at the entire landscape of your research and uh, don't make data archiving or the, the data uh, repository, your last resort to solve your problems that you might have uh, come up with an answer in the beginning. Okay, I think that's a really good point, especially as I said, Germany was um, only in the last 10 years starting to address this. Um, how's the UK perspective on this, Christina? Can you hear us? I think Christina is currently not available. Um, <clears throat> maybe then we go to uh, Marijana at the moment that she continues where Oliver left off. Hi, hello to Hi. everyone and thank yeah. you for thank having you me. Much. Yeah, we can hear us. Yeah, great. Uh, so I, I have just... Uh, few general remarks on importance of uh, ethics in data archiving, because I think, well, ethics is important in general. So both in research, but also in everyday life, does it is also important in archiving. So I will speak probably from the perspective of data archivist, not from the perspective of, uh, of a researcher. Uh, but uh, so the general principles, as you already said, Dimitri, in, in your presentation is do not harm. And this apply to researchers, but also to us who are working uh, on archiving data. So we should also not uh, do any harm to participants that were involved in this research. So one important component of research is also building trust between researchers and research participants. And this trust shouldn't be undermined by data archiving, especially data sharing part of data archiving because we archive data because we want to share them later with other researchers. And in my opinion, actually, not sharing data could be considered not very ethical. This is, uh, yeah, because participants have involved their time. Uh, they have given 
some answers to researchers. And if researchers are keeping these answers only for themselves and only for their research, which will last for two or five years, then, well, we are not giving enough respect to these participants. And maybe to add this relation uh, with GDPR and this importance of keeping personal data safe, this is especially important in times we are living in uh, because personal data have become, become a valuable commodity to sell. And that's actually why we have GDPR. GDPR is not there because of researchers. It's there because of companies who are selling your data. So I think the responsibility of researchers and also of data archivists is to, uh, is to talk about these issues. It's to stress the importance of privacy and also ethics. And also, I think that ethical issues are actually uh, stronger than uh, GDPR itself. And this was also mentioned uh, before me. So okay. this is my take on in, on the importance of ethics. Yeah, I think you added a really important part to this discussion. And um, maybe when we switch to Otto now to discuss this question, he can include his perspective on this respect towards um, the people who are filling out surveys, who are answering interviews, can be maybe included as well. But Otto, maybe you add your points um, for the moment. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I can tell something about the Austrian case. Um, we have no long tradition in data archiving in Austria since Auster, the Austrian social science data archiving was just establishing since five years. But I can confirm almost everything uh, what Oliver said and also what Mariana said about trust. So. Um, First of all, it should be noted that uh, data archiving is only one step in the entire research process or in the data life cycle. And research ethics is something that must be considered from the beginning and in all phases. And from a research point of view, um, I think there are many good reasons for researchers to comply to ethics, um, also pragmatic reasons. Um, if you violate ethical principles, then a research project may not be funded or you will end up being seen as an untrustworthy researcher and who wants to do any business with untrustworthy people or institutions so as we heard this is a matter of trust and this is also very important especially here in austria we have a problem with science denial in the public opinion um, as you can see in several opinion polls many people just do not want to believe what researchers or scientists have to say, especially during the COVID-19 crisis, um, we, we could see that. And so trust is very important. Now from the um, archiving perspective, when it comes to data archiving, um, ethical questions mostly occur in the context of data protection and privacy. Um, as a data archive, we have to follow the GDPR and the national data protection legislation, just like everyone else has to follow these rules. And most data we archive are quantitative survey data about people. And these data might be personal data or at least has to be treated like personal data. Um, in fact, in most cases, we do not really know if, these, um, if we work with personal data or with anonymous data. Um, personal data is defined as uh, information about identified or identifiable people. And most of our work um, deals with checking data and um, process data in a way that prevents identification. So we try to anonymize data, for example, by deleting variables or summarize information. But we also have to look uh, that the data remains reusable for research. So we cannot delete every possible identifier. It is always a trade-off. And ab above all, ethics are important because it goes beyond GDPR. Basically, I think of two points. Um, in case of personal data, as we already heard, GDPR and national legislation here in Austria um, allows to process data under certain circumstances, even without consent of the data subject. And that is, for example, for scientific purposes in the public interest. And even if this is in line with the law, 
we always must ask um, if if it is ethically okay to share a certain data set. And in the case of completely anonymous data, um, GDPR is no longer, no longer applicable, but there could be still reasons why these data are sensitive or worth to be protected. For example, when it comes to sensitive topics and vulnerable target groups, uh, such as children or people with migration background or refugees, maybe some of the research results could could um, lead to disadvantage of, of these groups. And sometimes you have simply the problem that data archiving was not considered in the research planning and in the, or the consent form promises participants that even the anonymized data will not be shared. So G GDPR doesn't prevent um, from sharing this data, but at least you will have an ethical problem as we already heard. So I close this comment with a plea for careful research data management so that data sharing does not fail because of things that could have been avoided. Okay, thank you so much, uh, especially for going back um, to this aspect of careful planning, carefully mapping out um, all those processes. Now, Christina, may you add something to um, the comments that were already made here, coming from uh, this perspective of uh, data archivist in the UK. Hello, and I'm so sorry when, when the technology works, I love it, but when it doesn't, it, oh, but I am here now. So that is, that is most important. And I think um, similar to what everyone else has said from a, from a UK data service perspective, ethics are ever so important when sharing data. And with UK data service, most of our data does come from surveys um, and it's I will say much easier with the caveat, still hard to anonymize it, but much easier than when it comes to qualitative data. But it, for both of them, we do take ethics highly in consideration. I think they're the most important bit of our job to make sure that no harm is done to the participants and researchers are understanding that more and more. And we can see, especially with um, GDPR, we're in the UK, the UK GDPR, they are now having much better consent, informed consent forms, clearly establishing how the data will be used, how the data will be shared. Uh, so they understand, I think, much better the ethics. And I have to say, discussing about ethics and all the protocols used, I think are actually helping researchers understand is not only about open access as we see it with everything should be available under a Creative Commons license. No, how do we ensure that we put the safeguards in place that we promised our participants? And how do we ensure that no harm is sought because they decided they want to share their data, but we promise them it's going to be anonymized. And as Otto was saying, it's hard to make that distinction. Is this anonymized or is this de-identified? But um, at UK Data Service, we try to um, enforce a best effort methods. So for um, quantitative collections, if they're very hard to handle, we might use semi-automated tools to assess the disclosure risk in the data, make sure that the data is anonymized. Um, and I'm going in my an on anonymization, I'm linking to some of the tools. Um, I hope some of you will find them interesting. Uh, once you get to, to play with them, they're like, oh, life-changing, but also for um, qualitative data, what we do, we provide a lot of templates that researchers can use to hope that they actually manage to anonymize the data. And we have um, what we call a text anonymizer tool, but it's more of a text de-identification tool. It's just a word macro that highlights everything that is in capital letter or contains numbers. So it helps researchers understand, oh, I can't release this information. I need to delete it. I need to put a pseudonym in place and so on. But no, my, I don't think there's anything else most important than ethics. And I know it's hard from a data archive perspective because we want to make as much data available as openly as possible. But we always bear in mind this ethics responsibility that researchers we have and ultimately we as data repositories have on the population as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for the answers to this first round. And before I go to the second round, maybe someone wants to uh, 
someone of our panelists wants to take Ryan's question about the idea that uh, data may be sensitive or contain personalized information, but we put an embargo on it and say in 50 years it can be released. What about this um, idea or concept? Does anyone uh, an idea to comment this or an op uh, opinion on this? Yeah, I, I do. Oliver wants to start. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, this would be a matter of consent as well, but it's also a technological and an organizational challenge. So, I mean, uh, our institution is around for 60 years now, but we're an exception. A lot of others uh, are around for like 10 years, 15 years, 50 years time is a long time span. It's an even longer time spent for digital data. So digital preservation is a challenge here. And the legal perspective, I think so too. You can get consent on putting an embargo on individual data for 50 years. In fact, we do have something similar uh, for the National, uh, our National Archive in Germany. So you have time spans because people have no, um, they cannot prevent uh, institutions from archiving personal level data at the National Archive, for example. Um, so there might be records of you in the National Archive, but then there are time spans of when this data can be released after your death or 100 years after your birth. So these time spans in general also by courts are uh, uh, considered to be in long enough uh, because data protection legislation mostly relates to living people and not to deceased people. But then there might be your relatives uh, as well also involved. So this is this would be really challenging and just leave the data around for 50 years. Who will be the person to use the data 50 years from now? You know, there are these uh, experiments of time capsules where things are guarded. And then in some future point in time, 200 years from now, the capsule opens. Uh, and you uh, get this lucky gift from the past. But uh, I think this is hard to do. Uh, I would be very doubtful. I mean, you can put an embargo on it for a year or two, but then the data needs to be released and used because otherwise uh, it, it's very challenging to keep it alive. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for this yeah. answer. Um, maybe Walter can say I, something about... I, oh, sorry. I, I, I wanted to just uh, confirm what Oliver said at the beginning that they are very they, they exist for 65 years but in uh, smaller countries in a country like Croatia where I come from and where we just established Croatian social science data archive two years ago uh, this is just wishful thinking so we should first uh, work on some sustainability issues. And so, yeah, this is very hard to promise to somebody uh, that their data will be kept safe uh, for 50 years. But I think that this is valuable to, to, to do because especially for qualitative data, because qualitative data uh, contains very interesting personal narratives and these personal narratives then in the future can be very interesting for not just social science research but, but also historical research because it just gives you very valuable insight in that uh, that period of time uh, more insight than uh, than just plain numbers because you can you can even uh, uh, research language uh, 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 in a, a distant future, like 100 years in the future, you, you would like to uh, research about what what's have changed in, in language. Yeah, but we have to make sure that our organizational issues, we have to have this political commitment also to do this. And maybe national archives are good partners for, uh, for achieving uh, this kind of uh, commitment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Can I much. make a, a brief uh, amendment to my answer? Because Ryan now asked, I was referring to your embargo. So for me, 50 year embargo means the data will be available 15 years from now. My point would be make it available for the next 50 years for research. So these are the takes. So it's not, it's then we find the gold, I think. <laughs> 
Okay, um, maybe now Walter can add something from a humanities perspective on this. Uh, I, I basically totally uh, go along with, with what Oliver mentioned earlier. Uh, like, um, first of all, it's always about consent. So even if we want to keep data untouched for 50 years, that doesn't resolve our consent problem, basically. So we have to ask people to use their data anyway, or we should ask the people to use, to use the data anyway. So we might as well use it right away and then keep it in use for God knows how many years. Um, so that's that would be the first answer. And the second answer, yes, of course, it, it's a very much a sustainability and technical question, uh, just as much as, it, uh, as, it, as it is an, an ethical question. Uh, we have had our, our institutional repository for the last 18 years, and we are currently in the process of migrating it to the fourth uh, rebirth. Uh, and it's a nightmare. <laughs> so, um, um, so yeah, I think it's very much a, a technical issue as well. But either way, like it, it, whenever you want to use data of people, you <coughs> ask them for consent, even if you don't have to. And a, and a general embargo, like 50 years, uh, doesn't really help you because there might be people who are alive for considerably longer than those 50 years, as Oliver said, with these clauses like 10 years after death, 100 years after birth, whatever, uh, make a lot more sense. So the, the clauses have to be individual as well. Uh, uh, but either way, you need individual consent to, to even approach this at all. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for these insights as well. Now I would go to uh, Otto and ask him if he encountered any situation in, the, in his past as an archivist or someone who works at a data archive where he had to consider ethical implications when it came to archiving data. Um, yes, I remember one case where um, we had the situation um, where we had this problem with the consent form that was used. Um, it was a, um, a psychological study and um, the data depositors wanted to archive the data in our repository and the process was almost done. And in, in the last step, um, we talked about the consent form that was used and there was clearly mentioned um, the data will be completely anonymized and the anonymous data will not be shared with others, only within the research team and their partners. And so completely anonymous data, um, there would have there would be no problem with GDPR, but um, you promised your participants to not share this data. So we couldn't archive this, this data set and we just didn't take them. So it brings us back to the idea of the informed consent and what you communicate as a researcher towards um, your study participants. Okay, um, Mariana, what about you? Did you have any situation where you had to consider archiving and not archiving data? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, and we still have this data set stored on our local storage system and they are still not uh, not published and it was the similar case by case uh, 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 but just uh, it was not just explicitly anonymized data could not be shared with anybody else uh, it was mild 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 more mild like in a sense uh, that data Data will be uh, available only to research team members. So we collected the da these data sets a uh, few years ago, uh, and we were afraid to do anything with uh, with, with with this data set uh, in terms of publishing. But now we are learning that this uh, that that there can be um, several interpretations of this statement. And we uh, got this input from researchers themselves because they were actually thinking about personal data will not be shared with anybody else, but anonymized data, well, it was not, uh, the problem is that th this was not explicitly stated 
in this uh, information sheet for the survey. So we are now more inclined to, to do this. And I hope actually to learn something from this discussion and what, uh, what others have done in uh, such situations and what is your, uh, what are possible interpretations and are these interpretations valid enough? I've seen uh, a very useful resource from ICPCR uh, and actually reading through this uh, material from ICPCR where they uh, also mentioned this case when researchers are uh, before GDPR, although in, in, in US they don't have GDPR, uh, but they had a similar interpretation. So I was actually wondering what, uh, what, what others are, are doing with such cases. Okay, perfect. And I think this is uh, one of the points where we are just realizing that there's a whole lot of things to consider and discuss about the particular wording, the particular interpretation of a law and a situation as an archivist where we are, yeah, um, having to make, make judgment calls. There is not always a situation where we can actually say this will forever be this interpretation or um, this has to be considered in that way and it won't change in the future. And especially the case you put up where, oh, the researcher understood it as that and that way when it comes to personal information. So this is really um, of relevance here. Um, okay, uh, Christina, do you have any case that you uh, may say was problematic or was uh, something where you considered archiving or not archiving? You might have noticed I kept nodding during yeah. everyone's answer because <laughs> I think this is such a such a huge issue we as archive encounter because again I'm going back to we want to make all of this data available but when we receive a participant information sheet that says all the data will be destroyed and while I appreciate the researcher might come back saying, well, I meant personal data. It's one of those, put it on its head. What did the participant understand? Because if you're saying everything will be destroyed, I'm pretty certain they understand, because that's what I would understand, that you will not keep anything once the project finishes. And it's, I think it's becoming more and more difficult because of course you have a lot of researchers that are driven by different policies, different um, publication journal policies and so on. So when we start having these discussions with them, actually your data can't be shared because of X, Y, Z. They are trying to find a way which might not be the best way to proceed to make the data available while that data shouldn't be available. So it's, it's very difficult. And I wouldn't say we have a lot of scenarios like this, but especially for qualitative data, maybe a couple in a hundred, it's always a consent issue. It's very interesting data, but we can't make it available. We had a couple, however, of very happy scenarios where initially the consent they had did not allow data sharing. And we've asked, would um, retrospective consent be possible? And they obtained retrospective consent up to 97%. It was fantastic. We just had a recent one a couple of months ago, um, and they completely not realized they have to add in, uh, yes, I allow for my data to be used for uh, future research and educational purposes. So we had a whole discussion with this researcher explaining why we need to have that in place. She went back to everyone and we're talking, there were probably around 50 interviews uh, and I think 48, 40, 48 or 49 interviews we were able to make available as anonymized and under safeguarded access so only researchers can access the, the data. So there were safeguards in place. But there are some happy stories, uh, but there are also some stories that are very difficult to handle um, because we can't allow that data to be shared. Uh, it's not us trying to stop the open science agenda or by any means. It's just making sure that no participant is led in the wrong way. Okay, thank you so much. And you already brought up uh, a point I want to um, address that was added to our Padlet before. And I would say 
anyone who wants to chip in from the um, panelists may start. What about um, the idea that there may non-ethical actors coming from uh, po the political field, from the economic field, that may have some agenda or some arguments about using data, and then it's archived and it may be available, what can be done or what should be done to um, ensure that male practice is um, yeah, limited? when it comes to archivized data, archive data. Yes, Christina. If I can, as we actually have an example, we didn't think it would happen, but it did. They were convinced that a specific government would want access to the data to do well, what researchers wouldn't do. So what we decided to do was to apply stricter conditions because they had concern for that data to be shared for future uh, research and education. So we added an extra safeguard and the data can only be made available under permission only access. It was anonymized data, so we're not talking about uh, personal data. When it comes to personal data, or de-identify data. So we don't have any of those um, direct identifier name addresses, but we still have a lot of information, um, hence making it um, personal. And again, I'm talking from the UKDS perspective, we've been here 55 years. So it it's a bit of a different type of situation. But what we've done is we've set up a secure environment back in 2012. So data that is considered personal can only be made available via the secure environment. And I'm going to talk a bit later on about what we call this five safe framework. So only accredited approved researchers can actually access the data. Nothing can be taken out unless it's actually checked for secondary disclosure. So I think there are solutions here to protect from misuse of data, but to bear in mind that it was mentioned before as well, it does depend on the infrastructure and the resources. In, in the UK, we're very lucky, but that doesn't mean all the other countries are so lucky to have so much funding and backup to provide all of these different um, access levels. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Does anyone else have something to add to this, maybe what um, can be done or should be done from an archives or even a researcher's perspective to limit the potential for misuse when you share data. Yes, Otto. Um, I have no concrete case we had in Austria, but in general, um, I think the more sensitive the data is, the more restrictions you have to uh, set on this data set. And that's why we in Austria, um, we uh, in our archive, we distinguish between open access data and scientific use files. And these scientific use files, um, they are restricted to scientific use only, and only researchers uh, would get access to this data. So if you uh, um, deal with an unethical government, you can discuss this if Austria has a <laughs> government which is unethical, but usually um, uh, uh, members of the government are no researchers or scientists, and so they should not get access to this data. That's, that's the point. Um, and everyone must comply to the terms of use. And um, so the data received from our repository um, but terms of use also include that um, people or researchers who uh, receive these data sets may not share this data with other people and not with the government. Okay. Um, I think that Walter wants to directly follow up this comment. Uh, yeah, um, I was just thinking, uh, I, want, I want to complicate things even further. Um, in, in the sense that maybe it's also a question of what research questions are we allowed to ask? Um, because if we collect data, and I'm being the devil's advocate here, please. But, uh, if we collect certain, certain data, um, despite all our best efforts, that data may be abused. Uh, no matter what terms we do for access, et cetera, et cetera, safety procedures, et cetera, there's always someone who can hack that data and who can get that data. And we had these discussions in humanities context very often. For example, if you do um, stylometry, you know, 
uh, key loggers, stuff like that. Uh, like the way you type is personal data about you and it's very distinctive. Uh, and like colleagues of mine have developed stuff for the Ministry of Defense, um, you know, about automatic locks of, 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 uh, of your keyboards and stuff like that. If the person that is typing on that keyboard is not in sync with the typing style of that person. So that's highly sensitive information. And the question is always, yeah, like where, I mean, obviously we do have the freedom of research clause everywhere. So we can choose our research. We can research whatever we want to research, but the, the heretical question about it is probably, should we though? Um, but that's just, you know, just to complicate matters, yeah. not really to answer, <laughs> to answer that question in the first place. Okay, so you played devil's advocate here and Oliver wants to follow up on this. Yeah, I just wanted to to add a little piece here. I mean, since we are, uh, this is a train the trainer. Um, you, uh, this relates to what Otto and Walter have said. Um, it's of course difficult to go after people that misuse your data at some place. And we do a global data service. So if data is available in English, we have users from Singapore, somewhere in Africa, South America. Um, but there are, uh, and Christina knows this uh, very well, I guess, uh, from the UK, it's the five saves principles. And as trainers, you should you should look at these. And this is uh, the trust relation, not only the researcher has with the research participant, but also you as an institution or repository have with the, uh, the researchers. And um, this is, for example, an important point being developed on national level in Germany, but also in the, the framework of the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. It's the uh, it's authentication and authorization. Uh, in the end, you want to know if the pe person receiving the data, working with the data is reliable and trustworthy. And this will be a major topic because uh, the challenge we're facing, I mean, there are a lot of scenarios that have been developed in the 1980s, for example, early 1990s of what can happen to statistical data, what is statistical disclosure and all this. But now we're facing ubiquitous data yeah, con that can be used as context to any data point we are giving out. And to oversee this is almost impossible. So uh, handling the contact with the researcher will become more uh, and more important. Uh, we do use uh, data use agreements uh, and also as Great Britain or the UK is an, a fabulous example. I think that for some 15 years or more, you've got this system, it used to be called Athens, now it's Shibboleth. Uh, so as a researcher in, the, in Manchester, you can access uh, things at the UK data service without problem. And uh, the UK data service knows that you are a trustworthy person. And this will, this idea and the technique or technology behind this will spread, I think. So it makes life easier also for archives and repositories to handle sensitive data then. Okay, perfect. I think this was a quite a good way to um, discuss this and bring us back to the train trainer aspect of the session. Um, there's one final remark in our Padlet board um, before we close this session. There is the question about how to deal uh, with a clash of opinions from funders and researchers when ethics are considered about data archiving, which may be a relevant scenario going forward as more and more funders are putting um, restrictions on the question if something should be archived and shared or not. Christina is nodding along quite well, so maybe she will start with this. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, ESRC uh, were the very first council in the UK to mandate data sharing, and there was a clash between that and usually qualitative researchers, uh, because especially 10, 15 years ago, it's done on a trust basis. They're doing the interview just for me and so on. So there was a lot of argument, this data can't be shared. And of course, there are situations where data can't be shared, but they, there wasn't an effort in seeing whether the participants would like the 
their data share, just that option, would you like your data share? So um, this is a great train the trainer question because to actually challenge that, we have started doing a lot of training on the topic, a lot of ethics, just basic ethics, a lot of consent training, a lot of offering support from one project to another one, how to best write your informed consent, how to best write your participant information sheet. And even to this day, we go to different universities cities or research centers just to do a brief introduction to what we can help with the materials that are made available out there to actually help researchers. CESDA has some great materials when it comes to informed consent, so just signposting and saying, look, all these materials are made available for you so that we're trying to alleviate this clash to actually convince all researchers most of the data can be shared as long as ethically this has been considered and it's only an option there it is not something that is compulsory we're not making anyone share something they shouldn't share and i think there was quite the shift in mentality but it does take time it takes a lot of training to be done um, and this is one of the reasons I was I was very grateful for this event to bring so many people from different archives trying to share our um, expertise and how best to deal with scenarios like this because as we can see all of us are encountering the same well not necessarily issues but challenges so. <laughs> okay uh, maybe Mariana do you have anything to add to this well, we have a different, completely different situation in Croatia because our main funder of competitive research in Croatia still doesn't have a mandate to share data. But uh, they started just this year, they started with mandatory data management plans. And of course, the last chapter in the data management plan is where you will share your, your data. So, and other issues are the same. Uh, so, yeah, some researchers are concerned about this because they perceive this uh, uh, obligation to create data management plan also as a, an obligation to share data. There is still no obligation, but this is this is good from our perspective that they are perceiving this. But also there is a there is a group of researchers. You always have some progressive researchers who would actually want to uh, share their data and they were not satisfied that uh, their funder is not requiring this. So you can you can have both. You can have these concerns from researchers, but you can also have very progressive researchers who wants to have this kind of, of requirement and how to deal with, that, with, with, with people who are uh, afraid or concerned with, with data sharing is what Christina uh, clearly explained. It's just more and more education. It's just uh, uh, explaining that there are mechanisms to share data safely from consent to anonymization, to restricting access and to, to repeat constantly that uh, open access when you come to social science data, it's not necessarily achieved by publishing data openly, because I feel that some researchers, when they, when they hear this open sharing, they are very afraid. But when we explain that this doesn't have to be so open, this, 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 this needs to be accessible, to everybody who is interested and who is ethically, who has this ethics background to deal with this kind of data, then then it's then it's easier. Then then they are not so afraid because yeah, there is a, there are mechanisms to share data ethically and legally. I think that's a great point, and um, I'm especially liking that there are even more discussions going on in the chat about those issues, because this highlights that we are hitting a very important spot at the moment with topics that people are interested in. However, to close out the session, I would like to make a quick lightning round on the comment that was put forward by Nichols, who said that there's technology is, technology is changing and data sets may be used in ways that people do not expect them to be used, especially when we are forward thinking uh, and not uh, only thinking about 
what is happening right now. How can we even think about this, make sure that such things do not happen? There's a very extreme example in the chat, but on a more general level, um, we are looking at a very now situation, what is happening with technology and what is possible, but the standards of now must not be the standards or opportunities of tomorrow. So how can we deal with this and um, work with this in, a, in our environment, so to speak, as data archivists? Lightning round, everyone one sentence, not too much. Maybe Otto can start as he's just leaning in. Um. So I don't really know because I have no technological background. Um, but um, what I can say is that there are international standards and state of the art, and we have to refer to these standards. And what comes in the future, it's hard to hard to, hard to predict. So whatever comes technologically, you have to be aware, but you you cannot. You cannot foresee this uh, everything. Yeah. Um, someone else, still one sentence or one and a half sentences? Yeah, Oliver. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think it's not so far fetched. Uh, uh, the this example. I mean, we are seeing this uh, with uh, social media or uh, digital behavioral data. That is this future you're probably referring to. Uh, the, the core example is Twitter data. The majority of Twitter users are not aware of the fact that researchers can use the data, not only researchers. If you have a developer account, you can access this data. And there used to be what was called in the literature a wild west. People were just collecting this data. So I think the way forward, uh, as we are like in a well, a similar minded community, is raise awareness, talk to each other and come up with solutions. I mean, the the downgrade solution here, if we talk about Twitter data, is to only uh, archive or make public the the IDs and not the tweet account or the, the content better, let's just say. But uh, and, and I, AI will play a major uh, role now. This is why uh, people are calling for legislation and ethical awareness of this. It's now. <laughs> Yeah, I think the point that you raised is very important. A few years back, um, even more social media platforms were completely available. We had APIs to access this data and could work with it in a raw format. And after several political scandals, they started to uh, remove the front end access, so to speak, and even back end access in many instances. And now we need to think about this and work with it. And um, yeah, constantly monitor the problems and the issues that may pop up and then react to them and even provide guidance and talk to the researchers who are doing this. And um, yeah, we're seeing lots of changes here. Uh, Mariana, you had a comment now? Uh, I just wanted to say what you just said. <laughs> we basically come back to to ethics and building trust. And uh, yeah, I also agree that we cannot avoid and we shouldn't avoid these technological developments because they can bring uh, a lot of benefits for 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 people in general. But it is important for researchers to deal with such kind of issues to be. Uh, uh, to learn about these technologies and to be loud and to to do education and yeah to be there because if researchers are not doing this and I see a role of our professions as data archivists to be loud about this privacy issues and combining social media data on a larger scale because private companies will and they are already doing this and this is this is why we cannot we just cannot avoid it we just cannot be outside of this we have to be active participants in this discussion and following back to to to, to ethics and building trust and all these issues there's still a hand raised by Walter is this uh, yeah I, I basically I just wanted to, to uh, enforce this as well, what, what Oliver and Mariana and you said. Um, I think our, our job, especially as, as trainers and teachers uh, in humanities and social sciences, 
is to make sure that the future will be with a society will be equipped with a society where more people think about doing good things with data than bad things with data. Uh, and one thing to ensure, or one way to ensure this, is to have an open data policy, because we will never know what people will do with closed, what evil things people will do with closed data. But if we have people doing evil things with open data, we can have more people doing good things with the same data set and working against those people who do bad things with that data if it's open, because we know what they're working with and we can work with it better than they do. And that's obviously a very optimistic view on the future, but hey. <laughs> uh, we should have these kind of <laughs> visions. Yeah, I, it, it was very nicely said, yeah. I think this was a perfect remark to close out the session because it offered a very optimistic view on open data and why uh, positive ethical components and open data are playing together. And I wanted to say very much thank you to all of those who participated in the Padlet, in the chat, and in our discussion here, because it offered so many different perspectives. And hopefully it was okay that we took 10 minutes longer than we planned to um, for this session. Maybe Christina, you will finish out. No, thank you all once again. We we should have assumed when it comes to ethics, we're going to, to have so many things to discuss and that questions have been fantastic. Our panelists have been amazing and thank you so much for your time. We're going to now break for our lunch break, uh, which is going to be 45 minutes. I'll move from my uh, Padlet. I was checking for questions. Um, so we're coming back at half past one uh, CES or 12.30 UK time. Um, I hope you're going to to be able to grab some lunch um, in the 45 minutes. We'll, we'll see you all shortly. And thank you once again to our panel. <coughs> thank you so much for this. Thank you. Being. So welcome back, um, everyone. Um, I do hope most of us made it back in time, uh, but not a problem if not. Again, we are going to be sharing all the presentations which are currently available on the Google Drive. They're going to be made available on Zenodo with a nice DOI and a citation. And also the recordings will be made available um, probably early next week, uh, I am going to follow up with an email once everything has been uploaded and, and made available as well. So after the lunch break, we are going into talking about anonymization, a key topic when it comes to um, teaching about open science, how do we make data available, how do we make their data available, especially in consideration with data protection laws um, in, in the GDPR context, um, from our end the UK Data Service, we've seen an increased number um, of researchers and training staff asking for training specifically on anonymization techniques, tools that can be used, um, and so on. Um, as always, please feel free to post any questions in the chat or on the Padlet, um, and we're going to, to address them. Any questions we might not have time during the session or better um, suited for the next session, we are taking, um, taking them on then. So, training on open science. Um, from experience at our end, um, we realized it's very important to have these um, five key things in mind when planning to teach on anonymizations. What are the objectives, clearly setting them up and so on? What is the context of the training? 
always introducing key concepts. And again, we're going to see here it depends on the target audience you have. It might be lower level or higher level, but it's important to have an introduction into key concepts, some tools that you can use. And this is by no means compulsory. You can use tools in your training or not. However, we've realized that using exercises, it's fantastically important because again, anonymization overall can be quite a complicated topic to teach on. There are so many different facets and having the exercises to keep the audience engaged and understand all these key concepts, it's important. So in setting the objectives, always try to consider who did you invite to the event? What is their level of understanding? Ideally, when it comes to a topic such as anonymization, you would like to make it quite custom. So for example, if you train um, data stewards, data archivists, it can be quite in depth with a lot of um, information provided. If you are teaching students or early career researchers, it's much better to have an easier understanding for them, all the key concepts clearly um, demonstrated on the slide and so on. Try to make sure that everyone understands the focus of the session. And I'm not saying you can't do quant and qual together, by all means, you can do both, but it's really important to make sure that you've defined exactly what you're going to cover. And of course, the length of the session. And the length of the session is clearly dependent, I would say, on are you including a lot of exercises, are they group or individual exercises? Are you using tools? Are demos included? Will the exercise include tools? So a couple of examples of objectives you can set in your own training sessions could be gaining awareness of issues and considerations of data protection legislation, gaining basic knowledge or advanced knowledge, depending on the target audience as mentioned before. And if tools are introduced, allowing researchers or data stewards to implement the semi-automated tools in their anonymization process. Now, when it comes to setting the context, um, of course, more and more um, research is now across um, country boundaries. Um, you have researchers doing, I don't know, based in the UK, doing research in, in France or in the States and so on. So always try to provide practical examples on how different legislation applies. Um, and Dimitri has prepared a fantastic worksheet that makes trainers think, how do we deal with different um, legislation and different types of data? So for example, when it comes to data protection considerations, something that we use in the UK as a, as a common example, Think of a researcher based in a country from the European Union, they have the UK GDPR, and they're collecting personal data about people living in a country from the European Union. So of course, EU GDPR applies, and there might be some other country specific laws as well. And this is where the UK example comes in handy. Me as a researcher in the UK, if I'm collecting personal data about people based in the UK, besides the UK GDPR, and again, UK GDPR is based on the EU GDPR, um, there are very, very small tweaks um, in, the, in the legal text of the um, legislation. Um, it might not be the case that UK GDPR would last for very long. We know in the UK there have been discussions about different new bills coming alongside, but for now we do have UK GDPR, but we also have the Data Protection Act for, from 2018. So anyone collecting personal data on UK citizens, either a UK citizen or um, a non-UK citizen, must adhere by the Data Protection Act in the UK GDPR. Or, for example, even more complicated, when a researcher based in the UK collects personal data about people across Europe, again, because UK GDPR mimics EU GDPR, very similar, it's very easy, but if this will change, then it will create even um, more difficulties, I would say, in order to respect data protection legislation. When it comes to key concepts, um, we've discovered, and again, it does depend on the audience, um, but even when we have um, advanced knowledge, 
um, I would say, it's quite important, even if on just one slide, actually including, okay, so when we're talking about anonymization, we're talking about different types of identifier. We have direct name, addresses, anything that can be directly linked to a person, but we also have the indirect identifiers, be it age, educational level, occupation, and so on. What are the different types of disclosure? And what we like to include as well is actually an intruder scenario. So who will actually want to gain information to the data and what they might want to find out? The identification and anonymization, again, especially with um, EU GDPR or UK GDPR, is very important to make this difference between the two types of working with data. When we are talking about the identification, clearly explaining is just about the direct identifier. Anonymization is much more than that, is ensuring that that risk of being identified is reduced as close as possible to zero. Again, if we use a tool, we're going to see that um, the risk is never going to be zero, it can be close to zero, but never zero. Also types of anonymization and trying to explain to researchers that we're trying to get statistical anonymization. But of course, we can have privacy by design that helps us with guaranteed anonymization or guaranteed anonymization to a degree. The data management expert guide covers key anonymization topics. Um, so in case you have not seen it, please do have a look. It covers anonymization methods, um, expert tips, case studies that you can actually use for your researchers to better understand how they can anonymize their data. The qualitative anonymization exercise example. Oh, and it seems the link is not properly um, appearing on my webpage. Um, it is from the data management expert guide and is showing how a transcript can actually be anonymized that it can be shared for future use. Very similar for quantitative data. And there are a couple of things that you can do here. You can either create a dummy data set for yourself and for the researchers that you're training. And I would say um, if, for example, you are teaching um, a group of people that are specifically interested in a topic, for example, heart disease, it would be great if a data set that includes, again, a dummy data set. This is not real data, it's just made up data. And then you're asking them to identify, are there any direct identifiers? Are there any indirect identifiers? What do you have to do with all these different variables to make the data available? Alternatively, um, back in 2021, CESFA kindly um, funded uh, another training about onward sharing of safe and clean microdata. Um, all the materials are available on Zeno though um, there are a couple of exercises for anonymization and ensuring quality assurance of data as well. So um, please do have a look at it and please do use the materials in your training courses. Now moving on to tools. It's fantastic um, if especially if in your day-to-day -day work you are using tools to facilitate disclosure control to actually have different tools provided to researchers. Um, we always advise that all the tools, uh, when it comes to disclosure control, they should come with this disclaimer that they're fantastic. They're, most of them are very easy to use. A lot of them has you, have user interfaces. So you just have to click the buttons. You don't need to know any specific code um, to use them. However, they do require quite a lot of training, high level of understanding from the people using them. And it's also important to realize that those numbers that appear on the screen might not actually have um, a real life um, meaning. So if we take any anonymization, quantitative anonymization tool, they use weighting variables to ensure what is the risk in the entire population. If I'm putting in an anonymization tool, a data set with a very tiny sample that doesn't have weighting variables, you might end up with something like a oh, 90% risk of disclosure because it can't calculate this population risk. So it's very important when it comes to tools to understand them very well when teaching and to always have different signposting.
for people. There's quite a lot of um, freeware available out there. So we have SDC Micro in R. Um, you can directly script in SDC Micro if you know R or it has a graphical user interface. And there's a lot of documentation available. QA My Data, again, an open source um, tool available to provide the health check on your data, but it also provides functionality for identifying direct identifiers with the use of regular expressions. Uh, more recently, uh, we have Amnesia done by OpenAir. It's a standalone tool. You install it on your computer. It's locally run. And again, it has fantastic documentation available online. MuArgos initially was um, uh, created uh, for Eurostat for government um, statisticians, but again, the software and the manual are openly accessible and very easy to understand. And finally, we have Arcs as well. All of them are freeware. You can try them out, see what works, see if it's something that you want to use in your archive and then use further on in your training. So main takeaways when it comes to anonymization, training, setting clear target for your training session and the expected knowledge. If you end up in a training session where the knowledge is very different from one person to another one, it's always best to have a couple of extra exercises um, that you might not need to use, but you can make available. Setting this clear objective so people know what to expect from the training session. Having the key concepts explained, and again, have a look over the data management expert guide. They're fantastically and very easily um, explained so that others can, um, can get the, the, the understanding. Trying to use different tools to provide an interactive session. If it's an online session, you can use what we've used today, like the Menti exercises. You can also have Zoom polls, depending on what you feel most comfortable with. Allowing time for questions, especially with anonymization, um, uh, similar to ethics, which we just said earlier, so many questions, um, and they do require quite a lot of time. We do usually advise maybe having something like the Padlet we use today so that the questions can be um, asked anonymously. So anyone can ask whatever question um, with no uh, fear of thinking, oh, people um, will think I did not know that. Of course, when introducing a tool, make sure it's the tool you're most familiar with, uh, because some difficult questions might come up um, and it's always best to be prepared. And this is a bit going into our next um, presentation, trying to always introduce a short um, presentation deck of slides about licenses and how different access levels can be applied to different data content. And I am having a look in the chat because we do have a couple of questions maybe. Oh, no, Dimitri sent the link to the Data Management Expert Guide. Thank you, Dimitri, for that. Uh, it is available in the slides as well. They are available on the Google Drive, and we're going to follow up with an email after the event and one next week um, for all the other different um, presentations and recordings. And now our next presentation is about license frameworks at CESTA Archive, and I'm going to just do a brief introduction to it. And load it, that's fantastic. Um, you might wonder, why do we need to cover licenses? From personal experience, it has come in very handy to explain to researchers, and as we just discussed earlier, when it comes to the open science agenda, they do have um, the main aim is do no harm to your participants. So emphasizing the role of licensing your data um, has um, changed, shifted the way researchers think. Um, and what we usually do is trying to explain to them, if you have a license, you're actually allowing others to understand how to access the data, how to use the data, but also how to share or not share the data, depending on the context. What we usually do is offer um, the open licenses example and Creative Commons is the one that's most used 
by different repositories. Um, the, the source of the table is the Data Management Expert Guide. Um, so in case you want to read more about it, please um, follow the link and have a look at the different um, license techniques. Now, when it comes to data licenses, it's all about risk evaluation. Is there risk in the data? Is there manageable risk, too much risk? So introducing researchers to open licenses, but also bespoke licenses is very, very important. And of course, whenever possible, provide concrete examples of different license frameworks used across Europe, across the globe. And shortly, we are going to have four different presentations. Uh, we're hoping to give you a, a brief overview of what CESA archives are, are doing. Um, our first presentation is uh, from Dimitri um, for the OSDA archive. We have Mariana from CROSDA, Oliver from GISIS, um, and I will uh, finalize the session with the UKDS license framework. Um, so that you have several examples of how licenses can be used in your training. I will stop the sharing of the screen and invite Dimitri to enlighten us. Okay, good. Um, I'll switch towards my presentation regarding licensing models we use uh, at Auster. It is typically following our guideline uh, set before that we want to provide access to data as open as possible to make it usable for as many people as possible when we publish data, but at the same time, make sure that it's as secure as necessary to um, protect the interests of participants, of the scientists, of the grant givers. And we are here working under the assumption that we as an archive have a societal responsibility and discuss this with our, um, yeah, uh, depositors and discuss this with the people who are on our board. We are typically discussing these issues with um, our financing partners, our university level partners to make sure that everyone is on the same page, what type of data can be published in what way. At the moment, we are offering two major streams of data. Um, regarding publication and licenses. The first one is open access, which is um, typically completely licensed via a CC BY framework. And all the documentation that it's accompanied is typically licensed in the same way. Those data sets are not meant for research, but they are meant for students and educators outside of tertiary education. So not university level, not the level um, you are typically seeing at colleges, et cetera, where um, it would be possible to use the scientific use file that Otto previously um, named. They are meant for policymakers and interested, pub interested public outside of academia. So those are kind of um, yeah, cut down regarding the data they contain and can contain. So every part of personal level data, like age, sex, is typically removed. Um, religion, et cetera, political um, ideas are reduced as well to meet GDPR uh, standards and to fulfill ethical considerations. Typically, this entails that we in the archive are taking a look at the data set and making a check which type of information should be reduced for an open access file, communicate this towards the people who are archiving or want the, to have the data archived and tell them what should be cut out of the data set if they want to publish it open access or need to publish it open access. On the second part, we have the scientific use file. This is typically meant for academic research, uh, for teaching. This is meant for um, our uh, bread and butter business, so to speak. And they are <clears throat> typically restricted to persons who can verify their credentials at academic institutions. And uh, in special cases, there can even be a manually controlled access where there's no broader access for those who have those um, credentials to make sure that only people who are actually needing this type of data can use them. This is um, 
in our case, a very practical approach because this helps us to divide public interest on the one side and scientific use scenarios on the other side. When it comes to the documentation for scientific use files, we try to be as open as possible as well. This concerns metadata, this concerns the questionnaires, the methods um, discussion to make sure that even if you are not um, allowed to use the scientific use data, in most instances, you can at least understand it, see how it comes together and how it works. Here, we are trying to uh, make sure that we are uh, GDPR compliant as well, but we take the special considerations into account that are opening up the use of data for specific scientific purposes. Both types of data set, open access and scientific use, can be embargoed for a given time. So when the data set comes in, the user can, or the depositor can typically decide for how long the data should be under embargo, because maybe they want to publish the documentation before they publish the data set. Maybe there are some concerns uh, regarding sensitive information or sensitive points that need to be clarified before they are published. So both open access as well as scientific use can be put under embargo and it's not tied to any particular licenses. To give a short um, example and not stress time too much, I'll give an insight into how this works in our dataverse. I brought with me the example of the Social Survey Austria 2016, which is now several years old and was one of the first data sets we, are use we were using in Austria to test our protocols. And <clears throat> you see, this is an open access file. People can directly access it, can directly download it when they want to use it, and um, they get a limited amount of data available to them. But it's simply a click away, and you see it has over 3,000 downloads. So it's used by quite a few people in um, Austria. And <clears throat> this has advantages because it's a quick and easy access. People can check it. People can take a look at it. However, the full edition is the so-called scientific use uh, edition, which has only around 500 downloads. So it's not used as much. It has certain restrictions in place. And you see here in our dataverse, there is this request access button uh, to be found. So if you are not logged in with your Austa account, if you're not already certified that you're a scientific user, uh, you can request access and request this type of account to make sure that you can access this file. In this data set, um, we are typically including all variables. However, in some instances, to meet GDPR regulations and ethical um, assumptions we have, we may uh, recode certain variables um, in accordance to the data depositors to make sure that people who are having very specific combinations and sociodemographic information that may only concern a limited amount of people cannot be re-identified or um, identified at all. This is very important to us because it uh, helps us keep a data set in place that fulfills its role in the scientific community and on the other hand, um, provide some sort of comfort that we know that all ethical and juridical uh, considerations are taken into account. And this is our current um, setup regarding licenses. And yeah, um, this is how we engage with our depositors. We are offering them the chance to either provide open access or scientific use files, and they can always add either format at a given point after they have deposited their materials with us. Yeah, that's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, and I'm now going to invite Mariana to give us an overview of the CRUSA um, license framework use. 
Yeah, thank you, Christina. I will now try to share my screen. Hopefully you can see now my presentation, which is now in full screen. Yes. Yeah, great. Thank you. So my name is Mariana Glavica. Again, I come from Croatian Social Science Data Archive. And just to give you a, a bit of context, uh, a few words about CROSDA, because uh, the main point here is that CROSDA is a very, very young archive. Uh, we were established two years ago in 2020, uh, after Croatia became a member of uh, SESDA ERIC, uh, together with some other uh, infrastructures like uh, SHARE, U uh, ESS, uh, DARIA, and uh, CLARIN. Uh, and in that time, uh, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Zagreb, was appointed by the Ministry to serve as a national coordinating institution for SESDA ERIC, and then uh, that, that's why we uh, established uh, CROSDA, Croatian Social Science Data Archive, at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, we also, as OSDA, use uh, Dataverse uh, for publishing uh, our data, and we still don't have uh, many data sets there. Uh, as I said, we are uh, still very young, which means that our license framework is also um, uh, very basic, uh, and we hope that we will develop it in the future. So our license framework, it's uh, a bit similar to OSDAS and probably to other archives also, uh, but it has um, uh, one, uh, uh, one difference. So uh, first we have uh, freely available data, which is open access, uh, and we use uh, and recommend Creative Commons attribution point uh, for zero, zero international uh, license because uh, as we figured out, this is commonly used uh, in this domain. Uh, for uh, this kind of data, no registration is required. So anybody can download uh, the data sets and uh, all uh, documentation, of course. Uh, and uh, when we are publishing data in open access, uh, we are uh, very strict uh, uh, about uh, removing any chance of uh, re-identification of uh, participants. Uh, this is a bit harder when we are dealing with uh, survey data, as you well know, uh, but it's it can be easier if uh, we are dealing with, let's say, experimental data, and we are also collecting uh, such kind of data, so we are not limited just to, just to survey data. We are also collecting uh, data uh, linked to uh, journal articles. And these data sets uh, are sometimes a subset of, of a larger study. And these data sets uh, uh, contain only variables that were used in this particular article. Uh, so these data sets, uh, uh, we are likely to publish them in, in open access. Uh, so the second group uh, is uh, data uh, available only for specific purposes, and one of these specific purposes is uh, scientific use only, uh, and another is uh, scientific use and teaching purposes. Uh, for this kind of data, registration is required, uh, and also accepting uh, general general terms and conditions for data use, uh, which are pretty standard among uh, data archives. So we were learning also from other SESDA, SESDA service providers. So we were uh, taking examples that we could fit in our environment. So these general terms and conditions are mainly uh, about, uh, we ask from researchers that they, are, they, they promise that they will not put uh, additional effort to re-identify respondents, uh, that they will 
will not share uh, data with with somebody else so this is a personal license and uh, and and similar requirements uh so one of the things that we were thinking about is what uh, what is actually scientific purpose and this i think it's uh, also it can be also uh, interesting uh, question now for this discussion and i would like to hear from you how how you how are you defining scientific purpose uh, so we allowed uh, we we consider scientific purpose to be a preparation and the implementation of scientific research so if you need uh, if researcher needs uh, data for uh, not just conducting projects but also planning projects for writing scientific papers for conference presentations uh, and for doctor doctoral dissertations and i think this is this is pretty clear uh, we also included uh, postgraduate spe specialist thesis but also thesis at the level of graduate studies and this is something this which can be discussed uh because uh, it's a because graduate uh, theses are usually not uh considered uh to be a scientific work uh but we uh, still included this in this uh purpose because uh, we um because uh Every student who is doing graduate thesis uh, has to have a mentor and has, uh, let's say, higher level of ethical education. Uh, so, uh, so that's why we are allowing also this kind of use under scientific purpose, uh, purpose use. Uh, and also, uh, one of the scientific uses can be uh, these uses which are needed for uh, reviewers. So reviewers would like to check the results uh, presented in uh, scientific uh, papers. So we also consider this to be a uh, scientific, scientific use. Uh, and then, as I said, we are separating scientific use only and uh, scientific use and teaching purposes. Uh, so why is that so? Because, um, uh, well, again, we are, uh, our main reasoning is uh, around uh, this ethical uh, issues. Uh, because both of these data sets, they are anonymized at, uh, at some level. So as you all know, uh, no data set which contains uh, a combination of demographic variables can be perfectly anonymized. So that's why these data sets are restricted. Uh, but then also in Croatia, we sometimes, as we are small country, so our representative samples can have about 1,000, just 1,000 participants. Uh, and also uh, sometimes research, research is done uh, on uh, graduate students. So we can have a data set which is uh, collected in, at, the, at the faculty. So students themselves have fulfilled uh, the, the, the survey. Uh, and uh, here we have this uh, this risk of uh, this higher risk of uh, re-identification uh, if um, if the data set is used by the student who was also included in who was a participant in this study uh, because uh, well it's just that they all know each other so it's this re-identification re is possible not only by combining demographic variables, but uh, also by knowing some answers. And uh, 
our assumption is that when uh, we are allowing uh, data set to be used for uh, teaching purposes, uh, that uh, students uh, not necessarily have to then give access to, to students who are uh, following the course. And we cannot be so sure that they have a high level of ethical education at that point. And of course, they have a teacher who can explain to them uh, uh, all these ethical issues. Uh, but still, we are we are for now we are on this cautious cautious side. Uh, so, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, we have. Uh, we will probably uh, develop all these uh, uh, license, uh, all these licenses, uh, but for now uh, we have a one issue with uh, open access licensing. Uh, I'm all for open access, and that's and I consider open access to be uh, without any kind of restriction. Uh, but uh, for us, it can be problematic because then our monitoring of usage statistics uh, it can can be hard uh, because we have no information. About uh, about the purpose of data use or, or about who is using the data. Uh, and one possible solution we have found using Dataverse uh, is uh, implementation of so-called guest books that, that are available in Dataverse. So uh, we will probably implement this option so uh, that um, yeah, this guest book can be filled by, by data users so we so we get some of this uh, information, which is not lacking for, for now. Uh, so that's all from me. Thank you. I will now stop sharing my screen. Thank you so that's much, it. Mariana. Um, as, as I said to you when we first met, I, I still find it fascinating how smaller countries have other considerations because as you said about the teaching use and research use that's not something the UK has thought about because it's such a big country so um, it's fantastic to hear these different um, needs of addressing a license framework because of where the license are being implemented it's, it's fantastic um, from from my perspective um, so thank you thank you so much once again uh, we are going to hear um, shortly from Oliver at GISIS about their license framework. And I hope, I hope people are seeing a pattern here um, in, in, in the way all the archives are dealing with licensing. Oliver, over to you. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, You should see my slides now. Yes. Okay, you. I don't see you, Jan, but it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, yeah, I'm with uh, Gesis. I will introduce our institution first. Um, so we are uh, one of the old hairs in this in this business. Um, we are a bit more than a data archive. So we as uh, we consider ourselves. Uh, social science research data infrastructure and that means that we are covering the entire life cycle of data from creation to reuse yeah this is very similar to you might have dealt with the icpsr in the united states or FOSS in switzerland so we do have a large uh, we have several departments that deal for example with survey methodology or with digital behavioral data now um, that gives us the advantage that we see uh, the challenges coming, so to say. So we are not, we don't have to rely on uh, solving problems at last moment, somehow related to what I've said before. Uh, we do collect our own data. So, for example, uh, Gieses is in charge of the, the German uh, social science uh, survey, uh, the ALBUS, um, the general social survey. So you might have worked with uh, the American version. There are almost oh, a lot of countries do have this. Uh, they go together into the International Social Survey Program, ISSP, uh, 
where we're also involved. So a lot of activities on, on all uh, areas of, of data. And uh, we also cover a broad variety of uh, research-based services uh, for research data. So not only uh, archiving and publishing, uh, but we also do teaching uh, closely related to the data on research data management, but a lot of on methodology and on statistics. And um, the archive, uh, I put this in quotation marks here because we've dro recently dropped the name, uh, is now a, the Department of Data Services for the Social Sciences, but it was founded uh, as the Central Archive for Social Empirical Research in 1960. And we are among the oldest uh, institutions in the field. Uh, ICPSR was second, I think, 1962. Somewhere. The UKDA was founded in the 19, early 70s. So already decades ago, uh, there was this idea of data sharing on a very different scale, of course. So we are talking about the age of punch cards here and later on magnetic tapes. So uh, no internet <laughs> on the horizon yet. Uh, we host about six and a half thousand studies. Uh, that is mostly survey data. A study for us, as for a lot of the institutions here, is not merely the data set, but uh, if we talk about a survey all, always, uh, as Dimitri has also uh, presented, uh, also the questionnaire and methodological information. So we want this information for uh, reusers to be able to assess the data uh, properly. Um, we do have different access classes. So most of our data is available for uh, download, uh, but we also have restricted access classes and uh, we follow, this has been mentioned before as well, this uh, catchphrase that has become popular with the Horizon 2020 program, as open as possible, as close as necessary. So when we talk about individual level data, we do also have time series data, economic time series data, historic time series data. That is all out of range. I mean, this can be uh, made available uh, freely. We don't use Creative Commons though, because we think that Creative Commons are not uh, the proper license framework for data. It's great for publications, but that is debatable. And uh, a bit more than 10 years ago, we've also set up, uh, when it comes to access, our secure data center, uh, a secure data facility for on-site uh, use. Um, we do offer a number of services and uh, closely related to what the other repositories and archives do, we do have like three standard archiving packages. We still call them archiving packages, but there's a free so-called self-archiving, archiving basic service, uh, then two for cost services, archiving plus and um, archiving premium. Archiving premium is where we do not only quality checks, but we also correct errors in the data. We come up with uh, variable level documentation and so on. So we create a variable report and uh, then you get a, a polished data set in the end. And uh, as I've also mentioned before, for more than 10 years, we are offering research data management training because what we saw in the past was that um, it was very, it is, still is for a lot of researchers, but it's, um, it was even worse in the past that researchers, young researchers especially, were stumbling into uh, the task of, of research data management that has always been a part of, of research projects. And uh, we thought, okay, it's important to come up with a training scheme to tell them about legal, technical, organizational things they have to consider, things like file names uh, or how, how to set up your files, how to secure your data. This has uh, moved to the SESTA level. So we were part of the SESTA training uh, as well. Later on, we hosted it for a couple of years. So the... Um, License framework, I'm, I've, I've put it a bit more graphical than the colleagues now. Uh, so for the, uh, there are two ways into, uh, into Gezes. That is the, the self-archiving. We have a self-archiving platform. Um, it's not a dataverse, uh, but it's, it's a repository software. What we use, this is a free service. Uh, we do basic ingest checks. So data comes in. Um, and then on the other side, we have Archiving Plus and Premium that work with a contract with a, and an archiving agreement. Um, the two 
uh, entry points, two interest points, they're very similar. So what we do is like the base, the, the core item of dealing with researchers is like to make sure that they have the rights to publish the data. Yeah, that is very important because only if they have, we can decide on a proper access class. And here we come to these uh, possible errors like uh, missing consent or other researchers involved that need to be asked and so on. Um, and once the data is at Gesis, um, we have let's we have different access classes. As I said, we are not using Creative Commons, but we have an uh, an access class zero, um, and that is close to open access, so it's it's freely available. You can freely download a lot of uh, a time series data, for example. And then most of our data is for academic uh, research and teaching. That used to be like the standard category. It's also been mentioned uh, before in uh, the presentations. Um, that is that data is also for download. And then we have data for download with uh, an explicit usage contract. So you see, the more sensitive the data is, the more restricted the access becomes. And then we have the secure data center. Um, all these uh, access or the the, uh, the access categories, the classes. Uh, they are based on our usage regulations and the usage regulations tie into the archiving agreements. So we agree on certain things at the beginning and uh, this has to be in line with the usage regulations in the end. Um, this is only like an, one image. Uh, I've included a link here uh, to a website that I've set up um, on standard, standards and workflows. Uh, this is a glimpse. Uh, I'm not going to go through any website now, uh, but there's one uh, dedicated site on data access where you find a lot of information on the terms of use, uh, the access categories, how how we do it. And um, there's also information on how we deal with uh, data ingest, what the contract looks like, and so on. So you might want to check it out. Um, and of course, we've also learned lessons in the past. So uh, we had these, the, the archiving plus used to be our standard archiving way. So we would check data also for critical variables. Sometimes you do find zip codes. In one case, we found names and zip codes. So critical uh, information here. Um, but then at one point, I don't know. I don't remember when, but self archiving became fashionable. So we had to set up a self archiving platform, uh, like UKDS did, like ICPSR did. And um, what we did, we opened two ways, and that made ingest a bit too complex. So there are two ways in there. And what we're doing now is we set up a one door. So people come, they have this one place. It's like, okay, I want to publish my data with uh, Gezes. I want to use the free service. I adhere to the, or I agree to the, the usage uh, regulations, and off you go. Uh, that means that we have to harmonize uh, the licenses here, the the um, the um, um, the rules that we apply, and we also want to streamline the other end of of data access or have an online uh, access portal. You can apply for uh, data access now, but it's still kind of old, outdated the way we do it. So we have to harmonize licenses for data access and we have to remodel the data, the access classes, by, because I've mentioned the access using uh, a usage agreement also. So we do have a restricted access class C and this would be C plus or C plus plus, but we haven't done this yet. So, um, you're always, I mean, it's a constant construction site you're working on when you're in a data archive. The longer you do it, the more the work. Um, and we, uh, one thing we also want to do is open our uh, secure data center for remote access. Uh, that is of utmost importance because people don't want to travel uh, 500, 600 miles to, to get access to data or 1,000 miles. I mean, Europe is not the biggest, it's the smallest continent. But we've established, for example, a connection to UKDS, so the safe room there. So it makes life easier for everyone. And that was it from my side. Thank you. Thank you Stop so sharing much. My slide. Thank you so much, Oliver. That has been very insightful. And we do have a very interesting question in the Padlet, uh, which I'm going to address to everyone shortly after uh, 
my presentation about the license framework that we use at um, UKDS. Um, and again, we're going to see things do cross over um, quite a lot. And this is where CESDA comes in fantastically helpful from um, an archive perspective, because we all get together, we can all um, say our challenges, work together in ensuring that the best practices are actually implemented across um, European archives. Um, so, in case you've never heard of UKDS before, uh, we host the largest collection of UK and international social science and population data. Um, and I've mentioned before, we are funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. And it's not only about access to the data, as Oliver mentioned, it's about the, the support and guidance offered through this um, research data lifecycle, as we like to refer it to. And again, this comes with the caveat, UK Data Archive has been around for uh, 55 years. Um, it started in 1967 um, and we were combined into UK Data Service in 2012 um, and we have partners in Manchester and GISC that are um, experts when it comes to specific type of data such as census data in different outputs from the census data. Um, UK Data Archive is the lead partner um, and our role at the archive is to provide the center of excellence in acquiring and curating eating data. So when it comes to accessing data, as we've seen in the previous presentation, and this was the main aim of the session here, to see how all the archives are actually thinking the same and we're all implementing, and the very key focus is the ethical concern, open when possible, closed when necessary. So um, in order to deposit data with the UK Data Service, similar to GISIS, we have a deposit license agreement that all depositors must sign. It clearly states the responsibilities on their part, but also the responsibilities on our part. Um, and um, our collections development and curation teams work together to ensure that the appropriate access level is negotiated for data. And of course, taking into account the ethical legal anonymization and so on. Again, the deposit license agreement is complemented by what we call the end user license agreement at UK Data Service. Everyone that um, needs to be registered with us has to agree to the end user license agreement. Um, all of our documentation is available under Creative Commons, so any archives is, um, are welcome to make use of the, of the resources. And again, the agreement very similar to the deposit agreement sets the responsibilities for both the registered users, but also for UKDS, so we provide access if you. Um, and the main takeaway from here, um, and we've seen that with uh, all the presentations, all the across that and this is, the main takeaway is we require researchers to act responsibly and ethically when it comes to using the data. And of course, we have to set up in case of a breach, luckily, uh, we did not have any um, serious breach in 55 years, um, and let's hope I did not jinx it now. Uh, we have the UK Data Service License Compliance Policy, which clearly um, sets out the rules. So, for example, if you share your credentials, this is a personal license. If you share your credentials, you might be suspended from the service. It might be a civil offence under the English and law regulation, and so on. When it comes to the license framework itself, it's a, a three tier from open to controlled. Now, when we're talking about open data, we are talking about no real disclosure risk with um, the additional, if consent to use the data as collected in place, we can make that data available. And it's usually applicable with um, interviews from public figures. However, most of the open data that we have, we're talking about aggregate data, census macro data, uh, truly anonymous data, as we like to refer it to. However, most of the data hosted by UK Data Service, similar to, to my colleagues, is under the safeguarded access level because there is this potential residual risk of disclosure in the data. So um, researchers have to be registered and authenticated and Oliver mentioned in the ethics section just before uh, about how we use this shibboleth authenticator. So when researchers create their account, um, it, all the information is hosted Hello. In the, um, Hello. Within, within the shibboleth um, <laughs> environment um, to make sure that um, they are the researchers that they should be. 
I skipped the slide by accident there. And finally, now it's blocking again. I do apologize um, if my Zoom um, being tired probably. And finally, we have control data where um, we have actually the real risk of disclosure. Here we are talking from a um, data legislation perspective, personal data. It's only the identified, we've seen in the anonymization um, talk. So it doesn't have any direct identifiers. We don't have names um, or full addresses and so on. But there are so many indirect identifiers that this data cannot be considered anonymous. So we make it available via the five safes framework. So for open access, registration is not required. Anyone visiting our website can simply download the data or make use of it in our um, online tools. Safeguarded data where registration is required and some special conditions might apply. And special conditions could include, for example, when we're talking about um, um, qualitative data and there is potentially a risk of meet, misuse from the context perspective. Um, it's a depositor permission only, so the depositors must confirm that they're happy with the researchers accessing the data, and then we provide access to the data. And finally, controlled access, which is registration. Everyone needs to be um, logged in via Shibboleth, but it's also about the five saves framework. Interestingly enough, I just recently found out the five saves framework is part of the legislation in Australia, so it might be something that comes into Europe um, as well. It refers to five safe, safe data, which means the data is de-identified. Again, there are no personal um, direct identifiers in there. Safe projects, all the people that want to access control data must have their project approved by the data owner or the research accreditation panel, which we have in the UK. Safe people, they need to be trained and pass the training. And I know this sounds like a lot, but if you attend that training, you will most likely pass it. It's so in detail, in depth, um, it's, it's very easy to pass the training. Safe settings, the data cannot be downloaded. So with open and safeguarded, we've seen, despite the fact that safeguarded might have additional conditions, researchers can just click the button, download the data, or we send it directly to them. With the safe settings, the data does not leave our secure environment. People can't take anything out or bring anything in by themselves. And finally, the very last safe is safe outputs, and it's about screening or everything that needs to leave the secure lab for secondary disclosure. Because while no microdata can leave the secure lab, you can still have, have secondary disclosure in different tables that are produced from um, microdata. That's not to say, again, we've had a journey of uh, 55 years, so we've learned quite um, a lot of different lessons along the way. And I would say, especially having, I'm going back, a deposit license agreement that clearly sets the responsibilities on both parts in explaining to researchers when training, archives are not putting this in place um, to make it more complicated, but to ensure that everyone understands their responsibility. Actually showing researchers, for example, what an end user license agreement looks like and what researchers can do to ensure that their data is respectful of the deposit license agreement, but also that end user license are not going to be come in a, in a breach situation. Finally, um, and this is the lessons that 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 we've learned, as um, Oliver mentioned, especially with the um, our international data access network set up, so we make available control data via um, via GCs, is having clear license compliance policies. The one that I've linked in my slide is the one directly for UKDS, but GCs has one so that researchers know what happens if they are in breach of the different end user license conditions that might apply when they're accessing the data. Now I will stop sharing my screen for a little while. We don't have any more questions in the chat, but we do have a fantastic question on the Padlet, uh, which I am going to share. Oh, there are a couple of questions in the Padlet. That is fantastic. I'll share my Padlet shortly. So um, the very first question I've seen, and um, Mariana, uh, Oliver, Dimitri, please unmute yourself um, and 
feel free to contribute, is this case about ethical concerns um, where the research team retained unknowingly in an old closet transcription of qualitative interviews conducted 30 years ago. There's no consent forms that have survived, um, and it was not customary at the time to propose to interviewees that they sign a consent form. There was also no digital archives at the time. Now the researchers want to archive this transcription in a digital repository. They can contact the interviewees, but they chose not to. Instead, they anonymize the transcription and place them in the repository with research-only access. Is this situation ethical? We've, we've had a similar discussion in the ethics panel. We, it all comes back to ethics. Um, any, <laughs> any takers um, from the speakers that would like to first address this from their archive perspective? Yeah, I can maybe go ahead. Um, There's actually uh, uh, a research data center that uh, we collaborate with or um, that faced this at a huge scale. Uh, they were looking at uh, transcripts or dozens or hundreds of transcripts from dozens of, of projects conducted in the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s, all from uh, labor economics. Uh, so uh, researchers would go into factories, uh, interview workers, no consent, uh, the, uh, all the, the stuff was placed in cupboards and, and closets. Um, I mean, the, the thing now is uh, you need a legal ground to handle this. Uh, and the one thing that you could use, and we've actually gone through this in, in our archive as well, if in ever we face a case like this, and that is legitimate interest. Yeah, so the, the, you've old data, uh, you may not be able to go back 30 years. I mean, what, who knows if the people are still alive, um, but legally you have to try. Uh, you have to try and then you have to wage interests, your own interests versus the interests of uh, the research participants. Um, and then we, for example, have come up with a, with a checklist for, zi for this, um, where people are <laughs> aware, for example, if they were part of a research project, why didn't you get gather uh, uh, consent? Uh, and it can be that the uh, checklist turns out against you and says like, okay, uh, you haven't even tried. And the way, for example, the data is, it's not it's impossible to, to republish it. But if you uh, protect the people uh, the best way possible, you might have a chance to uh, publish the data anyway without consent. That's even part of, uh, of GDPR as well. But uh, you, we are on the level of fundamental rights. So you have to wage these interests against one against each other. And uh, that's not very easy, but it's doable. No, that's fantastic, Oliver. And it yeah. is great to actually have a case like this to, to speak from experience. Mm. And uh, th this is very nicely explained by Oliver about uh, legal grounds. Uh, but another issue here is actually, is it is it ethical? Because as we know, these are, these may be two different things. And this is a hard question. <laughs> because as, as I said before, like at first I would say, sometimes it's not ethical to not to share data because as i said before participants have put some time in giving their uh, their the, the responses and they want to contribute to science and if you just if this is not if this data set is not used uh, in as many ways as possible then well it's a pity so from that perspective, I would say that uh, it is ethical to share this kind of data, having in mind that we can have also a legal ground for doing this. But there was another detail in this question, and that was that the researcher had a chance to ask participants for consent, and the researcher refused to. So 
now we are coming to this maybe muddy area of, of, of ethics. But then again, uh, yeah, we have to look each case separately. So it's not enough just to have this general description of the situation, but it depends on uh, well on the on the real sensitivity of this data and on many factors. So if the researchers did make this uh, assessment uh, on uh, related to GDPR and based uh, based their uh, actions on uh, legitimate interest, then then it's it's probably also fine, but yeah, I, I just wanted to point point this 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 detail that the researcher refused to ask for consent, um, and it uh, he he or she was able to do so, although it it was before thirty years. And then again, if you ask for consent, then you might uh, get a negative answer. So then you again have to balance this uh, legitimate interest and uh, and consent as a as a legal gra ground. Yeah. So no, no, no. It, the, the, the no <laughs> answer is complicated. Yeah. Can I add something to what uh, Mariana just said directly, yes. Dimitri? You want you also wanted to comment? I no, think. Um, yeah. You go first. Okay, it's a direct and the thing is uh, ethics and, and legal questions are closely related here, but if you are, uh, if it's illegal, you don't even have to consider ethics, so this is what trainers or people also have to, to think of. Yeah. Uh, it might be ethical sound, ethically sound, but then you are not allowed to do it mm. otherwise. Mm. Exactly, yeah. I think that's the command that's um, here the really important part to me uh, when I read through this um, scenario, because the legal ground has to be uh, clear that you can do it. If not, then there is no question. However, the ethic parts um, only also involves the research only paragraph here, because this is very broad. Do we mean any types of scientific use? We've seen between the different presentations that there may be some differences, what scientific use may be and may entail, depending on who is a scientific user, or what is a scientific use case. And the other point is um, most of the archives that we were discussing today have some sort of safeguards that even there are some, I would say, opportunities to provide restricted access that only certain people, not everyone who would fulfill scientific use scenarios can access them, but maybe uh, I would say access based on uh, fact checking if the people need this type of data, et cetera, that we can make sure and prove, find some proof that it's necessary to share them. And then we come to the point, is it a good idea to archive them? On one point I would say, any type of scientific data should be archived. And then we are at the publishing uh, situation. If it's archived, should it be published and made accessible? And this is, I think, then a more tough uh, discussion with the researcher, why he or she did uh, make the judgment call not to contact the interviews. Why do they think it's important to provide access at the moment? And who would benefit from it? Because maybe it's the whole scientific community Maybe it's a certain subset there where we could have a case why it should be available to them. And um, therefore, I think this is a prototypical case where as long as the legal obligations are fulfilled, you will have a long discussion with all parties involved. Archivists, the researchers themselves, maybe even um, some other form of stakeholder who may be of interest here, be it political, economical, whatever. And I think this is just to add, I, I totally agree with what everyone said. And I think just to add is that context in regards to um, domestic legislation as well has been covered in the previous presentation because with, with the UK, for example, we have the Digital Economy Act as well. So besides legitimate interest, potentially the Digital Economy Act would be used if the data was, was actually um, gathered 
initially by someone based at a public organization, they do have this option of sharing um, data um, under the DA because, of course, it depends on the data as well. It says um, it was anonymized. And we've just discussed recently, how do we define clearly, especially with call data, is this properly anonymized? Um, in in um, um, UK, we have uh, the Information Commission Office um, that provides guidance and we refer to effectively anonymized, or is it actually only the identified data? It, it's a fantastic question. Um, and I think as, as mentioned, it has so many different factors, but the bottom line is this difference between legal and ethical, and we can't discuss ethics if it's not legal, but we can find some legal here, but the ethics will be a very long discussion with the researchers, especially around why did they decide not to do the consent option, um, clearly seeing that literature um, is arguing that when you recontact participants for data sharing, they actually agree to it. So what, what were the, the, the reasoning there? And just to add about this uh, research only part, although Dimitri already uh, uh, tackled this uh, a bit, this is not too clear because not uh, all research is scientific research. So it can be, I don't know, journalists are doing some kind of research. So do we want to allow this uh, also for journalists or not? So this this also, this also part, this mechanism also needs to be in place. And at Archives, we are taking care about this to, 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 to make clear what we mean by scientific use or research use or any other use. Just the phrase is not enough. Now it will probably be a very long uh, meeting and many calls with the researchers to try to better understand who was the data collected from, who they want to make it available, why they did this, why they did that. But it's certainly a very, very interesting situation. And someone added, um, and it, it's regarding this ethical concern, the, the, the last bit, um, does GDPR apply to doc documents in the National Archives? And in the previous question, would it make sense to deliver it to the National Archives for storage digitization, just to be sure it's preserved without the intention to use it as of the moment? And I think, again, this might differ from one country to another one. Uh, because of, of, of legislation. I know for a fact that in the UK, the National Archives are, are very keen on um, storaging and digitizing, and I'm sure they would be very interested in a collection like that. But they come with the caveat, it will only be made available. They define the lifespan um, of a person as 100 years. So depending on it was collected, they would minus how ever old they were, and they would add up to 100 years until that's made available. But I don't know, Oliver, Mariana, both of you um, unmuted yeah. yourself, so you have comments about this. Uh, I just want to add uh, about um, this thing. So the digitization by itself, it's not enough for long-term preservation. This is one important thing. So our so National Archive might digitize old service, old data, but that's not just enough. You have to, as we all know, in archives, you have to do much more uh, in a sense of documentation and making making your data readable and clear. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but usually archives would, would do also do this this work i mean they it's it's strange thing we've dropped the term archive because a lot of people in germany that we asked said like okay oh, this is like storing away stuff but actually archiving is all about making it available in the future uh so uh but we are all in the same boat here so i would like to answer the the first question does gdpr apply yes uh, it it's uh, different from the the data protection directive that was in place before from 1995 that had to be transferred into national laws. So if you had a national uh, data protection act, it would relate to the data protection uh, 
legislation before and GDPR applies directly to all member countries. And um, the all laws had to be adapted to GDPR. So, but then all, uh, also most countries do have uh, for their national record administration, as it's called in the US, for us, it's the federal archive, that's the national archive. You have your own law. So there's a specialized law, but then it's the framework of GDPR and the, as it was been mentioned before, uh, the loopholes, the exemptions have been uh, um, filled by specialized laws. So GDPR applies directly. And that means that uh, if you come along with the uh, results of a research project, you would, for example, want to archive at the National Record Administration at the Federal Archive here. They would ask you for the legal ground of data collection as well as well as we would. So it's not like the uh, the secret place where they just like hide away your research results and don't ask about where it's coming from. Uh, they would ask the same questions and then you would have to present either a consent or legitimate interest or a legal ground, a, a law. Uh, so for example, your federal statistic or your statistical office is collecting census data on the basis of a specialized law usually. So that is another legal ground for data collection. Um, and it can become a bit tedious because then, um, for example, subnational laws also apply. Now, thank you, Olive. I just went on to the second part that it was linking with the ethical and did not reply to the to the first part. The, I would say the rule to remember if it's personal data, GDPR applies. That's the that's the bottom line. It's personal data, GDPR applies. And then we go down, as Oliver said, in the different loopholes uh, in, in national legislation. Uh, but we have another question, and I realize we'll, we'll take a, a short break shortly. Um, I was just wondering how anonymization and archiving data connects with the bigger discussion on reproducibility of research. Of course, here we're thinking about the reproducibility crisis. An article may have been very interesting or controversial findings and the data used in the article archives but anonymized through aggregation and deletion of some variables. Does this mean in theory that some quantitative social science research cannot be reproduced? I don't know if either of you, Mariana? Well, well, I would say that we, if we apply all these mechanisms that we are applying on other data sets, uh, so if there, re if somebody who is uh, who wants to reproduce this uh, results, uh, in our definition, at least in in CROSDA, that's why we, we included uh, this this purposes for replicability in our scientific use. So we can consider this kind of effort to be a scientific use. So this is also one kind of uh, research effort. So if the data is uh, published anonymously in open access, then of course this is not enough to reproduce the research. But if there are some uh, variables that are risk, risky for identification, uh, we can store this data set uh, in, uh, in another license, in a license for scientific use, and then ca that can be done. Although, again, it depends really on, uh, on, a, on a case by case. Or I don't know. Access can be provided upon, uh, so researcher can be asked to provide access directly, not through through the archive. Yeah, it, it really depends uh, on a on a on a on a on a case. Yeah, I think. In, yeah, in uh, <clears throat> our case. Um, we are having a solution where this is exactly a controlled access scenario. For example, um, if the data is so sensitive that the article that was published needed to have some variables um, yeah, aggregated, deleted, or changed for the um, publication of the data, then in the background, there should exist a data set 
it can be given uh, to reviewers or people who are having a, um, yeah, I would say, mandatory interest in uh, this data and they can then access it in a very controlled environment for replication purposes, for example. Um, I think the main point is that open access is not that uh, a good idea for replication in the social sciences because most models, be they statistical or otherwise, include uh, personalized data or data that is very much tied to individuals. Think about um, educational attainment, age, sex, gender identification, etc. And this type of information can't be openly published in most instances, at least not in a way that we can use it usefully in a scientific article at the same time. So yeah, in in, in psychology, it's more more often this is the case that data can be used because then there are not so many surveys. There are more experiment when we are talking about experimental data, which are mainly produced in psychology. Uh, then it's a different story. Now this has been some 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 fantastic question, and I the the only thing I would I would add here with um, what we do in UKDS is uh, we might make data available under different um, access levels because we do offer deprivation in house, um, so we might have a version available under safeguard that allows only so much um, reproducibility, and then have the controlled version, the very disclosive. Uh, data. But as Mariana said, there is also the possibility via bespoke data sharing agreement, obtaining the data from the researcher to do the reproducibility. So I think there are various ways ways to look at this. Um, I am conscious of the time, but uh, this is a very interesting question. So I'll, uh, this will be the last question for now, and then we break for a little bit before the, before the um, breakout session. Most of the archives are part of larger organizations. To what extent are you involving your data protection officers in this decision? What is legal to store? Um, I'll just briefly mention at, at UKDS, if we have, um, um, we're part of uh, University of Essex UK Data Archive. So if it is a very complicated scenario, we would get the data protection officer from University of Essex involved. And worst case scenario, say we actually have a data breach, this is where the data protection officer gets involved as well. So it's they're very linked. They aren't seen as, um, as separate um, entities. And Oliver, you've, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, so we are uh, one of those larger institutions, and uh, we do have an external data protection officer. And uh, with the GDPR, we have set up a, a working group on data protection because it's an issue in all departments. So it's an, an expert group. Uh, and we've also this year hired a lawyer just dealing with, with legal questions here, mostly on digital behavioral data first. And we have one person that is like coordinating the things. So because we are running into these questions all the time. Um, and yes, we try. what we try to do is uh, not to load all these questions to one person. And it's uh, it's good to have exchanges like in, within SESTA or we are part of the Leibniz Association as well. So yes, we do ask other people as well. No, and thank you for mentioning the, the lawyer, Oliver, there, uh, because, yes, sometimes it might be beyond the data protection officer. And it might be something that we actually need legal advice. We can go back and say, yes, from a legal perspective, this is all this is all fine. And of course, CESA comes in very handy in ensuring that we have these exchanges um, and we can make sure that best practices are applied well. Um, we've been here for almost two hours again, um, so uh, let's break for a, for a short break. Um, we'll come back at five minutes past, and I do hope um, the breakout room sessions um, are not putting people off. I have seen people, some people have left, um, and I'll say maybe it's because of other meetings, not the breakout room session. Uh, by all means, if you are a researcher, do stay for the breakout room session as well, because we are interested in finding out from your perspective as well what has worked in different um, training that you've, you've attended, what else you would like to see. They're very short, 15 minutes, uh, but um, I'll see you all back at five minutes past two, um, getting to stretch our legs a little bit.
Thank you and see you shortly. I hope everyone managed to get um, a little break. Um, I can see a lot of people um, have had to leave, uh, which is all which is all fine. We know it's a long workshop. We have so many things to cover, and we're so grateful for your questions and discussions. This has been um, more than amazing, um, and I think it clearly shows the need of having even more guidance when it comes to ethical and legal concerns. And this is something that clearly says that can take forward. Now, the very next session, um, this is um, aimed at trainers, but also researchers that have attended training to let us know what they found successful, challenging, or um, future opportunities for their training. Um, what I will do, and it's by no means compulsory, I will open up three break rooms um, shortly, uh, which you can join depending on your main interest when it comes to training. So we have one open um, room on open science training facilitated by my colleague Maureen, one about consent and ethical training facilitated by Dimitri, Dimitri and the very last one about anonymization and license training. I'll put the link to the Miro board in the chat is open to everyone. Um, please try to open it um, in your browser. Right at the very bottom, it gives um, instructions on how to access it. If we go on this question mark, um, we can close it. Um, you can zoom in as much as you want and then travel by holding two fingers on the touchpad to see the different elements. It's not a very um, long um, uh, research um, exercise. Uh, it's not a problem if you move something that shouldn't have been moved. What we can do um, is um, uh, realign it. So to move from one side to another on the touchpad, if you put both of your fingers, it then moves from left to right. And uh, once we have new different ideas, what I've done, um, I've created this post-it note already available for you. So I will click, um, left click on this post-it note here, and I can drag it to my rows. Please feel free um, to experience a little bit, drag everything you want. Again, it's not a problem if things um, go in different directions, uh, we'll put them um, uh, back uh, shortly. Another alternative, uh, Miro is a licensed option for exercises like this one. If you don't have access to Miro, um, Google has now launched um, uh, Jamboard, it's called, and Jamboard can be used very similar to um, um, Miro board for similar exercises when it comes to brainstorming about different topics. So I will stop the recording. We're not recording this part. Stop the recording. So thank you everyone that joined us today, both for participants, facilitators and speakers. This has been um, fantastic. Um, all the materials will be made available via Zenodo with a DOI. I will follow up uh, with everyone with an email just after the event with where the materials are available now and most likely probably early next week with the Zenodo DOI and also the CESA training YouTube channel where the recordings will be made available. Um, we do have a uh, um, event evaluation form. We would be very happy if you would take a couple of minutes to complete. Um, I'm just trying to find the link. I save it. It is here. Oh, now it doesn't want to copy. There it is. Um, it, it should only take a couple of minutes to complete. Um, let us know what you thought about the event. Uh, let us know about other new events that you would like hosted. I think we've seen a pattern here around um, ethics 
uh, more hands-on events about uh, exercises, ethical, um, legal compliance, and so on. But um, just to say thank you so much once again, all, um, and we'll be in touch via email very shortly, and also next week once all the uh, presentations have been published um, and made available as open access, so everyone, everyone can use them. Thank you so much, all.